What is going on, grunts? Welcome to another live. Celebrating uh, something special. You guys notice? I got an award. Can you believe that? They gave this guy an award. Unbelievable. Let's get rid of that crap. You guys know who we are. How's everybody doing? Let's open up the chat. So I figured uh, we could celebrate by doing a q and I haven't, uh, haven't answered questions just directly in a long time. If you want to come on, <clears throat> we'll bring you on. You can come in and shoot the shit with us. So uh, let's figure out how do we share that. There we go. So I got my PP slapped for playing with weapons live. So here's the thing. Why don't I get in trouble for playing with these, you know? What if I stand up and start playing with myself? Is that okay? That's a weapon. All right. If you want to come and shoot the shit, here you go. All are welcome. You don't have to be on camera. Just, uh, you know, have a microphone. Have some freaking headphones because uh, that goes sucks. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? We got another rainstorm. No snow, but another rainstorm. It's good stuff. Cheers to you guys. Somebody asked if I drink all the time. Yes, nonstop. All the time. Perpetually drunk. Cry. Keep crying. <clears throat> All right, comments are flying by as usual. Um, what do we got? Ah, just everybody saying, hey, congrats. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's all thanks to you guys. You guys are, you guys are awesome. I'm surprised we lasted this long. We started breaking out the freedom stuff, and we're, we're magically still here. <clears throat> there is a special guest we're going to have on tomorrow. I'm not going to mention his name because he appears when you mention his name and then everything shuts down, but we're going to try to live stream with him and see how it goes. So I'll probably get, I don't know, I might get slapped on that one, but just going to chit chat. How are we coming in? Um, I think we're live on Rumble. The Rumble, these uh, programs don't want to work with Rumble. No, it doesn't look like it's working. Okay, well, screw Rumble. People keep telling me, they keep coming to YouTube telling me to go to Rumble. And, and my question is, why are you on YouTube telling me to go to Rumble? If Rumble's so awesome, why are you here? You shouldn't need to come to YouTube at all. YouTube has its issues, but you know what? Um, I'll be a shill and say that uh, YouTube basically just reflects modern society. Most Americans are freaking Karens. They want to ban stuff that they don't like. That's most Americans, left and right. So YouTube represents that. <clears throat> you can freaking boo-hoo all you want about it. That's our culture. All right, let's see. <laughs> yeah, don't say his name. What's up, man? We'll see you tomorrow. You, you can come in on this one if you want. <clears throat> so we got another storm coming through. We might have some connectivity issues. Yeah, PBR, that, that's that's my preferred thing is PBR. And uh, it just so happens that where I shop, you know, Coors Light is what they always have in stock. It's not my preferred beer. The funny thing is people give me shit about what I drink. And it's like, all right, well, I've been all over the world, lived in Germany for a long time. I've had all the good beer, all right? Um, in America, to get a good beer, you're going to have to pay. And good is a relative term. 
but you know, ammo is expensive, guys. <laughs> what the hell, man? It, all these freaking hipsters these days. Beer, wannabe beer connoisseurs. Oh, you got to drink an IPA. It's a man's beer. Yeah, it's hoppy as shit and like 12 bucks a freaking beer. No thanks. I'm good with this shit because it makes people cry. It has alcohol in it. <clears throat> Let's do a test. So... I had some Ber uh, German buddies out here visiting, um, and they almost died in the May heat. But let's see, uh, where's the um, where's the alcohol thing? Last I looked, these these were like four point two percent alcohol, and I can't find it, of course, because I'm on the spot. Hmm, it should be on there. All right, well, well, I can't read. 4.2%. 4.26% some tiny little letters. <clears throat> that is alcohol, guys. Alcohol is alcohol. You can fucking boo-hoo all you want. The thing about the light beer, so, you know, I am a dumb grunt, but I did study some things, and I'll tell you what. Alcohol is alcohol. But you know what's good about the light beers is there's less carbs in there. Is that because we're watching our uh, bikini figure? No, maybe. Maybe we want to keep that girly figure. But the point is your body uses energy to break down everything, literally everything. Okay, so if you're making your liver break down alcohol and then you're making the rest of your body, your liver included, break down Carbs, not necessarily a bad thing. Carbs are not bad. But if you add alcohol to carbs, notice this is why when Americans travel to the rest of the world and they drink real beer, which real beer, like Germans call their Hefeweizen's a meal. That's like their lunchtime. Because there's like 400 fucking calories in each beer, right? Because it's super hoppy, all the carbs and stuff. It's a wheat beer. Well, your body's got to work on that too. So your body's breaking down alcohol, which is work. And it's breaking down friggin' well, it's processing alcohol, but then it's breaking down carbs too. So light beer, you may notice all the rednecks, mountain guys, they all drink light beer. Why? Because you can fucking drink it all day, all night, nonstop, and you can still mostly function. <laughs> that tends to be the redneck diet as well. So, yeah, I lived in Germany for a long time. Uh, I visited Bomberg. One of my buddies lives there where they have over 140 beers brewed there. So all you want to be beer connoisseurs, you can just suck the peanuts right out of my butthole because that's what I can tell you about you fake beer connoisseurs. If you don't like that, uh, refer to the sign. I'll point at the sign. YouTube is cool with light beer. That's got to hurt. But alcohol is alcohol. I've drank, seriously, any, let's, so let's name some beers. Every fucking beer you guys are going to name, I've had them. I've had them all. Don't care. You know what? I've had expensive beer. I've had expensive whiskey. I've had $300 bottle freaking whiskeys. I've had super cool Scottish freaking Scott shit. I've had it all, man. Um, You know, and if you're a dipshit uh, hipster, that wants to overpay for alcohol. It's all poison when you think about it. Who gives a shit what the name is, what else it has in it? <clears throat> yeah, most of you guys get it. Uh, Yingling, yep, yeah, I tried that. Yingling's pretty good, man. You could get that on most military bases. I first heard about it when I was over in Jersey, New, New Jersey, for a school. Crap army school and a crap place. New Jersey, if you guys have never been to Jersey... It's exactly like the Jersey Shore show. Exactly like it. When you're on the Jersey Shore, you know, uh, the ocean is garbage. Cold water, you can't swim in it. The beach is shitty. Um, the boardwalk looks like the Jersey Shore. <clears throat> There's a bunch of friggin' orange, overtanned guidos running around. Uh, the countryside is pretty cool. That's the first time I saw Aldi's, the uh, cheap shopping market from Germany over there. 
It's the first time I've been to a place where a lot of Americans spoke German, too. That was kind of cool. But yeah, that's where I tried Yingling and got into it. And then you could drink it on base, but it's still more expensive. Yeah, so we got some butt hurt about the beer. Yeah, it's got to suck. It's got to suck to to have such a miserable life that shit like that bothers you. But I could buy a case of my shitty American beer and save money for dirt cheap and save money on ammo. So, yeah, have fun with that, guys. Um, all right, let's see. Let's get into some shit. So you guys asked some questions. We're doing a Q&A. <clears throat> Bud Light. Now, you know, uh, fortunately, before all that silliness, I was never into Bud Light. That's one of the light beers I just couldn't touch. No, none of the Bud beers. Could never touch them. By the way, it was fun breaking the news to my German buddies that Anheuser-Busch, anheuser was a German company. They sold it to a shit American company, some American dudes, and then last I heard, the Germans bought it back. So Anheuser Busch, Bud Light, Buzz we Budweiser, that's uh, that's German shit again. So you can drink a Bud Light or a Budweiser and say you are drinking German beer, and they got to deal with that. <clears throat> the shit people concern themselves with. It's just like fighting over which NFL team is the the has the least rainbow flag colors in their uniform. Last I checked, like all the NFL teams, they were all kneeling for the anthem. They all had rainbow colors. They were all woke. They don't even do full practices anymore. Go look at what they're doing. It's all soft hitting and stuff because they're afraid of getting concussions. The steroids and cocaine is okay, but you don't want them to get concussions. Um, tequila and bourbon. Yep, I love some bourbon. I don't think I have any. I think I drank it all. It's in my camelback. I just did a survival video, a true wilderness survival video today. While well, it started pissing down on me out at the mountain. Yep, and I had some whiskey. People are going to love that one. Alcohol dehydrates you. You're going to die because I die literally every day. Oh, I also did a quick video. I'm going to start doing troll videos. That's just all I'm going to do. An entire video trolling people. And but I did one today about uh, jeans. Somehow our country survived for 200 years on blue jeans. But these days, the average, you know, outdoor hipster will tell you cotton kills. If it's below 40 degrees and you walk outside with jeans on, you will literally die. Like you won't get 10 steps out the door. NFL is rigged. Well, it's freaking uh, pride flag. That's what it is. And it's a waste of time. <laughs> Green Bay Fudge Packers. Uh... Thanks, Eric. Stag Arms, PSA, or Sons of Liberty. Yeah. Uh, well, most of my experiences in PSA, I've played with a lot of stuff, but Palmetto State Armory is good shit, man. Are you talking about beer? Are those beers? Uh, speaking of Palmetto, they have exploded. I don't know if it's the uh, YouTube guys pushing them, all of us shills, but uh, Saint and Glock and all those guys, they, they got to be losing their minds. And the thing is, what people don't understand about lobbies, they think lobbyists only are in the pharmaceutical industry. They're in everything. So I would not be surprised if, well, you've seen it with the NRA, but I would not be surprised if... Um, there's certain gun lobbies purposely making things shitty, pay, paying politicians to keep things shitty, uh, to drive up, make sure the violence is nice and high, but to drive up gun sales. I would do that if I, if I ran a, if I was in charge of PSA, yeah, I'd be lobbying to make things as dangerous as hell in the country because it's good for sales. Uh, but I would not put it past some of these really big arms companies to be trying to get rid of their competition. Uh, President Carter really helped with that. Just murdered a lot of freaking 
free market in America. Yeah, the internet's kind of dipping in and out. Um, <clears throat> I haven't lost it in a while, but if it does dip out and sits there, then we'll take a break. Wait till it comes back. It'll be all right. Civil War movie next month. Your thoughts? Uh, it looks pretty cool. I mean, it's it's Hollywood. If it's on a big screen, it's Hollywood. But it looks it looks kind of cool. I actually didn't even know that was coming out because I don't pay attention to any of that shit until I started seeing those memes. What the what kind of American are you? I was like, what the fuck? Like. The meme culture, especially on Twitter, I have zero clue what's happening. Like, I have other YouTube buddies, they write me, and they'll send shit to me, and I'm like, yeah, dude, I don't know. I'm totally a boomer in that sense, and I don't care. I'll share cool memes when I see them, but half of the culture, I'm, like, absolutely lost. <laughs> Way over my head. Somebody said something in a, in a live talk the other day. Uh, might have been with Josh from Modern Frontiersman. I had no idea what they were talking about. Victo's CCW jeans are outstanding. All right, I'll check them out. I like the LA police gear ones just because they're the cheapest. Like, uh, 511 is made in the same place and they're, you know, over a hundred bucks. Um, a couple years ago, I was really into Triple Lot Design. They're a really cool company, but very pricey, um, long lead time. They seem to discontinue their products very quickly. It's like they put out one line of stuff and then they cancel it. So I have a bunch of their stuff. I just I never reviewed it because I, I noticed when um I noticed when people were like, yeah, well, I went and looked this up and it's canceled. I'll go look at it and they'll say it was canceled like a month after I put the video out. So. All right. Lagging. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back. Chill out. Anyone have a dagger from PSA? Yep, I do. I have a dagger compact. I'd love to show it off to you right here, but I'll get my PP slapped again. But I've put probably 2000 rounds through mine and that is a that is an excellent pistol <clears throat> the dagger compact um it'll also fit your glock mags i think it's glock 19 so yeah it'll it'll also fit um maybe not all of the kydex holsters but the ones i've tried i'd love to show you but i'll get in trouble um the ones i've tried the <clears throat> the holster for the Glock 19 fits my PSA dagger compact. But yeah, they are outstanding weapons, man. And I was never a Glock dude. I know half the internet's going to shut down over that, but I'm like, I'm kind of like the hipster and ev everything. If I hear too many people saying the same name too many times, I just, I zone out and I'm like, all right, I don't want to be involved in that. I'm, I'm definitely a, a anti-mob person, even, and even if it's a good thing, sometimes a lot of people will be talking about something, and I'm too busy, you know, uh, breaking contact from that. <clears throat> I won't pay attention, and people will be like, dude, where were you on this? And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I heard people talking about that shit, and I ran away from it. And they're like, well, it's good shit. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah, so... Everybody and their mom and their grandmas will talk about Glock. So I was like, no, no, thanks. <laughs> I don't care if it's good. Too many people like it. I'm out. Too many people are talking about it. But yeah, the PSA dagger, I got the compact. Outstanding, man. And I've shot the shit out of mine and I've beat the crap out of it. You guys have seen my videos out in the mountains. I don't give a... If I destroy gear, it's like boo-hoo. I come back, put it in my burn pit or bring it to the dump. And we move on. So, yep. Losing a $300 pistol. Big whoop. But I got the package where you get a case. You know, and they give you a little key set in case you're in the occupied territory for it. 
uh, and it came with 10 15 round magazines and mine was like 399 399 for a case a key a key set and uh 10 15 round mags awesome all right jesus <clears throat> <laughs> SIGs. Um, I've played with them. You know, we use the the newer SIG Sours. I, I think uh, it's either M17 or M27, the, the new SIG pistols. They're overpriced, man. All that shit's overpriced. I got a buddy that has a Saint uh, AR-15. He paid 1200 bucks for it 10 years ago. It's ridiculous. That thing does nothing special that any other budget AR-15 does. Absolutely nothing. And the people that are going to back up those prices, they're going to, all the shit they throw out, you can say, well, this one does that. This one does this too. But it's really just because they overpaid and they know it, and they're just going to, you know, that that that's going to be their epitaph, all the selling points of the bullshit they overpaid for. I'm not knocking those companies for, you know, they have a name and a reputation. Good for them. They're going to charge for it. But... Uh, all the Gucci gear, man. I would ask questions. What does this expensive shit do that this budget stuff can't do? And you'll be um, you'll be surprised what the answers you find. Uh, what aftermarket IR illuminator would you suggest to either put on your helmet or the end of your rifle? Well, I just finished uh, reviewing the Somo Gear PEC 15, and I like it. It's really cool. It's plastic. People call it polymer. It's fucking plastic. Uh, but it hasn't fallen. There's only a couple ways it's fallen short of the military-grade stuff. And you can just watch the video on that. But overall, it's great. And I've seen, uh, I was, you know, I did put, I think, about 1,200 rounds through the rifle with it on there. No zero issues. And I've seen YouTubers do that too. So that wasn't really the point I was looking for. I wanted to see the the true abuse. So uh, like on the ATV, um, you know, just the last SEER challenge, uh, Stokermatic had my rifle with, with everything on it. And my uh, Six Hour Romeo 5 lost at zero. Um, over 2,000 rounds put through that. And it lost at zero from the quad rides, the off-roading. And it's in these really good rhino freaking clamps. They're like rubberized. They they absorb shock as much as possible. And my Romeo 5 lost at zero. And so people say, people have told me, well, you got a bum one. And that's strange because I put 2,000 rounds through it and it wasn't bum. So it couldn't handle the, the quad ride. My potted freaking... Somo Peg 15 handled it. Um, yeah, I, I've heard some good and bad about it. Mostly good, though, from the YouTubers. So I put it through my own test, and I like it. All the uh, <clears throat> all the military-grade stuff, um, the only difference I've seen so far is the, the metal casing, or it's aluminum alloy. It's, you know sciencey shit but you're still gonna have the same problems <clears throat> like all the covers breaking off any joe who's been to the field or or deployed for more than a month all those freaking lens caps break off Th that doesn't matter we re-zero our stuff every time we go to the range if we're sitting around the barracks or in an environment where we can't shoot we're laser bore sighting it to reconfirm our zeros so you know, the SOMO, I reconfirmed it, I think, once a month. No problems. <clears throat> I'm old school, like a revolver and fast loaders. Yeah, I got a couple revolvers. I got the the Dan Wesson is my favorite. It's uh, It'll shoot um 38 or it's the 357 <clears throat> that thing's fun man 
it's giant and heavy, but you know, scare the shit out of people. Of all the EU countries, which country's grunts would give you the most pause if you had to face them on the battlefield? That's a cool question, man. Snafu. Um, well, let's think about it. I worked with uh, more than 13 NATO countries. Uh, I could tell some stories about it, or I can just get to the point. But DJ, what's up, man? Well, you know, the Germans are still perfectionists, and uh, despite the news, they're, they actually do have standards. Like, uh, if you want to join the, their infantry and you have eyeglasses, you're not getting in. If you're too short, you're not getting in. If you have any kind of, you know, mental history, you're not getting in. Um, and just, the, you know, they don't have any freaking money. They have almost zero funding. They've got old equipment. Their recruitment is extremely low, but the guys who are there, they give a shit like big time. So the Germans are always dangerous. Uh, the thing is just like with the toys in America, Germans don't produce enough. They don't produce enough soldiers. So, you know, world war two, they, they were 50 years ahead of everybody in terms of science, engineering and tactics and everything still, still lost. Because they just didn't have the bodies. And, if, you know, if you take on 120 countries, you're probably going to lose if your population is 80 million. That's it's freaking it's math, dude. Do the math. You silly experts. Expert planners couldn't plan for the whole world turning on them and losing. Next would probably be the Austrians. Uh, we did a field training exercise shortly after the Crimea issue. Um, we did this massive NATO dick swinging competition. I wish I could remember the name, but it was in Eastern Germany, uh, and, and Grafenbeer, uh, no Hohenfels, our, our field training. Uh, so many freaking countries showed up and that was my first time actually seeing tanks, jets, helicopters, everybody doing no shit, linear warfare, advanced guard style shit. It was awesome. Um, but you know, being on the civil affairs side, we were in touch. We, we knew the whole op order. We knew how the scenario was supposed to go. And it was basically supposed to be the bad guys coming from the East and swoop in and they, they kick everybody's ass until the Western border of the box. And then all the NATO countries get together. They, they plan some shit and then they counterattack, drive the bad guys back East led by the American flag, of course. Um, and about halfway through the scenario, you know, about halfway across the AO, the entire armored division column from the bad guys just got stopped, just a dead freaking stop. And we were talking to our OC. This is like one of your NCOs who is not with your unit. He's with the local unit doing the training and he's kind of in charge of whatever, you know, there's each unit has a controller. So he was our OC guy for the, uh, for the CA, you know, we're good buddies. And he's like, yeah, man, we're waiting on the, well, on the, the column to get moving again. They're, they're just, they're bogged down out there in the mountains. You know, we're like, you know, are they stuck? Cause you know, military vehicles suck. They get stuck in the mud. He's like, no, um, remember that Austrian parachute infantry company platoon? I'm like, yeah, I was trying to work with them because I wanted to get the hell away from the Americans. He's like, yeah, they ambushed the armored division column and shut the whole thing down. Like they can't move. They, they are pinned down and cannot move. And it turns out it was just a, a platoon, which for the Austrian infantry, parachute infantry, it's like 20 something dudes. They split into teams and took hilltops. And while this enemy armored column was coming through. You know, they use javelins, indirect fire, TRPs, and all this shit, and just stop this freaking armored column. As it turns out, armor is scary, especially what we're seeing now in Ukraine, but in mountains where there's like just a few roads to get through, armor is useless. Not useless, but it's it doesn't have the advantage. So these crazy freaking Austrian guys, they didn't get the message. They didn't get the memo that the bad guys were supposed to get through and, and kill everybody at first. So they just fucking shut them down. Um, 
And when I was hanging out with the OC, I can hear the the OC guys, his buddies talking in his ear on their comms. And they're like, yeah, so like, we got to get out there on foot and climb up this hill and tell these guys to fucking stop. So the OCs actually had to stop the Austrians from murdering the enemy to let the whole training scenario continue. And I was talking to the OC and I'm like, dude, why don't they just let them go and just let this play out? We got 10 more days in the box, you know, like, so what if, if one Austrian platoon wipes out all the bad guys, that would be an epic freaking training event, you know, and it would, it would, it would show that our partners can actually do some damage when they know the terrain. And it would also be hilarious that the American op four got decimated, you know, <laughs> Typical American army, you know, he's like, ah, uh, you know, the planers, we can't allow that. We, we got to let the training continue. So everybody gets the chance to train. And it's like, well, how about let the American out for get fucked up for once? Cause they usually dominate and then continue with the training. Yeah. So Austrians are Germans. And then, uh, probably the Finns. Cause I've seen the training they do with Marines up there and their cold weather training and anybody who can operate in cold weather, you're a badass. So that would include basically all the Nordic guys, all the freaking pirate Viking dudes. Uh, those guys are badasses. I wouldn't want to mess with them. All right. Deutsche here. Yeah. It's first day of Deutsch. Um, it's ambition straight for dish or ambition through. All right. Fuck tons of comments. So, <clears throat> all right, people still talking about weapons. Scroll past that. Yeah, Mountain Jaeger forces. Yeah, before Afghanistan, I did a really fun train up uh, down there in the Alps. And um, it wasn't far from Salzburg, Salzburg, um, you know, the famous uh, Eagle's Nest area. And it was with a German ski infantry unit. That was that was really cool. We didn't do any cool winter survival stuff because there was only snow at the very top. But it was a really cool experience. Uh, we did some really fun rappelling with those guys. And what I did like about Germans and most of the European forces there is they're not super Karens like we are. We are extreme Karens, even in the military, even in the grunt world. Safety takes priority. If one soldier gets hurt, generals are asking why. And none of the upper leadership has the balls to say, well, we're training for war. We train as we fight. It's literally written in our doctrine. Guys are going to get hurt. They're going to get killed in combat and they're going to get hurt in training. Nobody has the backbone to say that. So basically generals flip out why a soldier got hurt. And if a soldier gets killed in training, holy fuck, it, it's over. War's over. If you want to hurt the American army, um, go to America and, and hurt some Americans. That They'll shut down the war, man. Generals will shut down. And my problem with that was I, I'd look at instances. We're supposed to learn from military history. So I'd look at, you know, we're big on risk, composite risk management. So if your risk gets to a certain level in training, the officers will shut it down. Nope, too risky. Um. And even in combat, uh, you know, I've been around for some some operation planning and even in combat, they're like, no, it's too risky. We're not going to do it. So I can just imagine the risk assessment that went up in while well, they on the Normandy days, World War Two, we didn't have risk assessments because we, we weren't we weren't the JJs. But I can just imagine if the World War Two guys uh, put that shit up today, the risk would be like ultra extreme. So D-Day wouldn't have happened. Too risky. We wouldn't have done it. We wouldn't have chanced it. We would have tried some safe way and then got our asses kicked. Uh, or they just would, we just would cancel the war. Too many guys are going to get hurt. We'll just cancel the war. All right. Fine. 
a lot of people were like, yeah, good. America shouldn't have been there. All right, cool. Well, then, you know, Europe is whatever it is. Hohenfels. Yep. Usually a muddy pit. Horrible. I do not miss that place. In the summer, it's beautiful, man. Really cool. But for some reason, the infantry, we would never go there in the summer. We would go to Graf to do our gunnery in the summer. Don't skip leg days. Nope. Do strength training. If you can only do one thing, do strength training. Swiss. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everybody over there are badasses. <clears throat> Especially their infantry units, because they, they as small as they are, and as horrible as their budget is, they still have standards. That's important. I would take three badasses who really care and are fit over 30, you know, general freaking assholes any day. Yeah. Oh, how the hell do we get up there? We got the IR Illuminator. Um, dude, I'm in America. What the hell you think? I think we got that shit in Germany. Well, I guess you could, but you need some, yeah, you know, you can get some cool shit in Germany. I'll tell you that. I got, uh, hunter buddies over there. Guys, German hunters, America needs to freaking take note. Um, German hunters, once you got that license, you are free. You can order ammo straight to your door. No background check. Uh, you can order silencers to your door. No NFA stamp, none of that pride flag garbage. So even my buddies in Texas, you know, running their mouths like, dude, where's your silencer, punk? Go get your NFA stamp. Go pay. But no, my German hunting buddies, they'll, they'll, they'll send me pictures all the time. Hey, check out the new suppressor I got straight to my fucking door. I'm like, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. There's, you know... I, I really liked living over there. It's a really cool place because there's a lot of good shit in Europe, especially in Germany, that we could learn a lesson from. And the standard suburban American who's never been outside of their bubble, they can't fathom that. You know, like America, greatest country in the world. There's nothing good anywhere else. And it's like, I don't know, man. The Autobahn's pretty fucking cool. Going 120 miles an hour is pretty badass. Uh, going 120 miles an hour while my passengers are getting drunk as fuck that's pretty cool and in most states still last i looked that's still totally legal open container in the car they don't give a shit because it doesn't automa I don't automatically mean the the driver is drunk yeah good times a lot of good shit over there uh i think they've changed recently because of the covid stuff like most western countries went to shit after that but germans used to be really good about telling people to fuck off and you couldn't get the cops called on you by the Karens. You couldn't get sued. You could just be like, dude, you can eat a whole bag of penises. And they're like, huh? Yeah. Okay. Shit like that. I miss uh, facts over feelings. Germans used to be really good at that. Why does this keep scrolling up to... Can we see your dude? It's right behind me. That's where it is. Yeah. You just want me to pull it out live so I can get in trouble again. You fucker. It's in plenty of videos. <laughs> Why the ass clickbait? You don't even need it. Relatable info channels need not to lure me. Okay, well, thanks. Um, dude, it's my style, man. I don't think... Uh, I think if you if you have a YouTube guy you're following you and you like every single detail about what he does, then good for you. But I doubt that's happening. So, um, I have buddies that I support and watch, and some things they do, I'm like, man, eh, whatever. But I get over it. That's what men do. We get over things. <clears throat> Midwest, greatest country. Yep. Dude, the flyover states. All the flyover stuff in America. It's the greatest places to be. That's why I love doing road trips. Uh, the last time I traveled across the country, I did a road trip. And I will continue to do that. You get to see so much of the, so much of the country you will never see. 
uh, even the people who fly into the major airports and then go a little bit outside that bubble, they like, you know, I like going to places where there is no major airport. It's like, if you want to fly in there, it's going to be with a helicopter or a small Cessna. There ain't no 777s laying in there. And if somebody ever really wants to go after us and nuke us, they're not going to nuke the freaking country in the middle of nowhere. They're going to hit the, the metros. Might do us a favor, you know, take out the trash for us, and then we just wait on the fallout to go away. But nobody's freaking... <laughs> they're not nuking freaking, you know, Montana or something. Uh, maybe they would for fun. I don't know. Hey, let's see what happens out there. Turn the ice to glass. Tom Porter, uh, sign me up for next season Sear Challenge. Well, go to the website and sign up, dude. We got a we we got a list of stuff you can send in so we can bet you. There is a screening process. I think we're up to uh, eight applications right now. I've been looking through them. So, of course, we're taking as many as we can because people back out. Uh, some people are denied. It is what it is. Did that show up? There you go. Go check that out. Military bases are in the middle of nowhere. All right, well, then they can blow those up. <clears throat> it's going to hurt a couple privates and some board sergeants. Might hit an ammo depot. American citizens have way more. We just don't have the nukes yet. Are vets preferred in Seer Challenge? No, not vets. Um, there's just a couple of screening methods we look for. So like in Season 1, I wanted other YouTubers because it's a good collaboration. And I also know, you know, there's no camera crew out there. So the, the guys are shooting their own videos. So having YouTubers out there in the beginning... I could at least assume, you know, they wouldn't be dumbasses and they would get good shots with the camera. Otherwise, it's the whole thing is wasted. Um, and then the veteran thing is kind of just an extra. It's an extra screening tool. So uh, not to say veterans don't have problems, but at least then we know at one point, you know, you weren't a lunatic and you, you had had a background check and stuff. But we'll also look into other aspects about you, and I will talk to you. So um, I do want some, you know, everybody who's come out so far has been uh, pretty tough and fit. But I would like some some different types for this one. I, I, we You still got to be really, you got to be superb at land nav. Um, I, I don't think the video does it justice, but the land navigation is is big time um comfortable in the woods with freaking bears and mountain lions possible meth heads you know that's something that we don't mention in the show um and not a moron we can't have morons <laughs> so all the guys that's come out they've all had they've all brought you know an elevated skill level in some category and then they've all lacked a little bit, and they've been really good matchups so far. But um, And physical fitness. Uh, we were talking about this live the other night, I think maybe in the Sear Challenge live for Season 3. Um, you know, people gave Eric Coleman some shit, and he doesn't look like a, a superstar, but he's fit. He is truly fit. 
Uh, I've worked enough with him and I watched him in that event. He he's, he's big, but he's fit. You know, he goes backpacking with 40 pounds, not an ultra lighter. And he's climbing legit 4,000 feet in a day. I don't know anybody else who does that. I don't, I only know a few people who can do that and then do it again the next day. And then the next day. So everybody has been a fit badass. They just may not look like supermodels. You know, because looks don't really, they don't really matter in that sense. Um, so physical fitness is a big deal. So, yeah, click click on that link. I'll share it again for anybody who missed that. Uh, if you're looking into the SEER challenge, YouTubers are preferred because then we know you know how to work with cameras. And we know I, I can I can give you a brief of what I need for your shots. And I know I can trust you with a camera. And to get those shots, because I'm not, it's a real event. I'm not going to come out there and babysit you and get videos for you. That's on you. If you screw around in the woods for three days and don't get anything on video, well, you just wasted your whole fucking time because I'll cut you out of the show. <laughs> Boo hoo. Thanks for playing. So the fitness is big. The veteran stuff helps because then at least. If you are a Army Infantry vet, at least I know you have at one point covered the 72 infantrymen's tasks. So whether you're, you know, an expert in them, like if you got your expert infantryman's badge, or if you are just generally proficient in them, at least I know you have covered them at some point. That's that's a big deal. <clears throat> You have hypothermia drills. Yeah, we do. Uh, we have a really good emergency response plan for it, um, which we've had to implement twice so far. Uh, with three times. Twice in season three. Season three was pretty rough. We had a lot of injuries there. But yeah, we were prepared for Tom and Clinton's injury, and I got hurt too off camera. Boo hoo. <clears throat> Texas Ted, feed the morons to the bears. Yeah. Just duct tape some friggin' ribeyes to all the useless people. Send them out in the woods. The YouTube part has been the hardest for me so far. Tom, do you have a channel or something? If you do, share it. I give you a shout out. I've been seeing your name for a couple of years now. Um, if anyone can make three to four clicks in a day in dense forest, you're doing good. Yeah. It's pretty good. Navigation is not easy. A lot of YouTubers do, they do really good videos on it. But once you, once you get there and in the mountains and in the terrain and being stealthy and shit, it sucks. I've gotten lost plenty of time out there where we host it. Um, temporarily lost. Um, Benjamin Sear, Sear four is going to be in November. Um, we're, we're probably going to do them all in November. So the event happens in November and then I get to the season as soon as I can. Uh, season three was the first time I got, I got it rolled out that early. I don't think that's going to happen anymore because that was really tough. Um, but yeah, November is a really good time frame to do it up in the Sierras with the weather and people that are out there, it's, we, we do it right. You know, we do it before Thanksgiving so we can avoid that crowd. And then we don't do it in December when a lot of people have vacation. It's not like we run into a lot of people out there, but it just lowers the chance when we do it during that time. And we don't have to worry about snow yet. 
We have had freezing temperatures. Like season two, we got cold as hell. Or uh, the opposite of cold as hell. <laughs> Patriots are definitely going to make it out there one of these seasons. Yeah, come out, man. Sign up. I've got uh, a couple pretty cool people interested. Have you guys seen in my any of my recent talks with other people? We've talked about it, and we all talked uh, offline about it or off camera. So I think I've got, yeah, I've got eight applications in, and I think I've got six that we're, you know, mostly a yes. We're, we are, where do you see our current geopolitical climate going? Dude, that's pretty bad typing. Uh, and how concerned should the normal citizens be? Well, I talk about this a lot. Regular people should be prepared for things that actually happen every year, all year. Wildfires, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, all that stuff. It happens literally every year. Uh, wildfires and hurricanes you can plan down to the week and for some reason millions of americans are caught off guard by that shit every single year and it's it's ridiculous uh there's nothing wrong with like i've got i just did a plate carrier video i don't know when it's going to be up it's sitting right by the door and then i got my helmet right by the door as well i got my rifle ready to go i got these ready to go i've got extra ammo I got I got a freaking radio sitting right here, all right? So if things go down, you know, we're ready. Okay, fine, cool. It's fun. It's a it's a fun fantasy. But how often does that happen? All right, probably happened to a couple people in 2020. Other than that, there's all kinds of shit going down all year long that people are caught off guard for. Okay, so plan for the worst, hope for the best. And just playing for regular shit. I don't troll for subs, brother. All right, well, then send me an email and tell me what page you got. Because it'd be cool to check it out if you got one. Or, or are you trolling now? <laughs> Bears got to eat too, yeah. You know, somebody finally commented in Season 3 about... Uh, the, the bear concern. I, I put it in the safety briefing when they come out here, but we only have black bears, black bears. So it's like, and we're not near civilization. All right. So black bears are black. I keep saying beers. Maybe I need to drink some beer. I need to drink some fine German beer. Black bears are only dangerous when they're habituated, like around national parks and other people. And they're used to getting into dumpsters and shit. They don't care about humans. Where we're at in the wild, I've seen, I've run into black bears a couple times. You yell at them and they run away. They're little, you know, they're little cowards. They're shy guys. So, not a big deal. But it was cool to see somebody actually bring that up, you know. Because we do put it into the plan. Like, we had Tom. He's from England. You know, I think he's been to America once or twice. I don't think he's ever dealt with bears and I'm like, okay, so most likely going to be a black bear. You know, give me a call, let us know, and freaking yell at it. <laughs> go go through the whole process. And he's looking at me like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Because <laughs> they don't have guns. <laughs> There's plenty of sticks to pick up, though. Whatever. Maybe an attack would uh, make it more interesting. Do you guys have an EMT out there? Uh, nope. What are this living? I do have a, a a really good friend of mine that is a combat medic. He was a CASF medic. Awesome dude. And I'd like to have him out there. Um, but honestly, for all the risks we have identified, we haven't come across anything that we couldn't handle. Because, like, uh, we're all the military guys on staff, we were all combat lifesavers. Most of us have actually treated legit wounds in real life. So whether it's battle, trauma, combat stuff, 
or just lots of other cases. Like, you know, in the grunt world, you see hypothermia all the time. Every time you go to the field in cold environments or semi-cold environments, you're going to see hypothermia every single time. So that's good. That gives you a good training value on what to do about it. Hot weather casualties, uh, you know, other little boo-boos here and there. Nobody's getting shot out there, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but, you know, we're all trained enough and we have enough experience to hand to handle whatever comes our way. Um, I did have another guy that was watching that was watching me for a while. I think he dropped off, but he he was a he seemed like a highly trained medical dude. Um, but, you know, we we actually do try to limit the staff as, as much personnel as we need to get things done, you know we we try to keep the staff to the the peop, the minimum amount of people who are going to give us the maximum punch for effectiveness on the ground so everybody has a ton of skills and then especially since season two you know having brent come out more um he's good to have around like everybody's highly skilled in many things so and you know also i just i don't want to have 20 freaking random people i don't know coming out to the place you know that's a, that's another thing it's not like uh security is a major deal because we're all heavily armed <laughs> you know somebody wants to try to chris kyle us they better bring some freaking rocket launchers and shit but it, it's just the logistics you know i gotta house these guys i gotta feed them i, I pay for some of their travel some of them i pay for all their travel i, I do what i can to help them out you know, so trying to limit the footprint at my place and try to limit the, you know, the money that we're hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging. That's what I'm more, that's the hemorrhaging I'm worried about is freaking money, not so much blood. All right, Tom. Well, if you're just going to keep teasing us, then I'm just going to, I'll quit asking. You hit me up an email if you want. Otherwise, I'm going to, I'm going to count you as trolling, dude. Uh, Alpha Ranch, what's going on? Q is a lot of military tactics, just common sense. Oh, question. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you could say that. You know, I've talked about it before, but if you look at the uh, the U.S. Army uh, Infantry Rifle Platoon 7-7, 7-8, one of them's platoon, one of them's company, um, now they're 3-21.8 field manual. It's public knowledge, guys. You can Google it and download it, or you can buy it on Amazon. That's like the infantry's Bible. We used to call the 7-8 the infantryman's Bible. And it's basically everything you need to know is a grunt. And it's like that thick. It's, you know, like uh, I got the Ranger handbook. Oh, uh, nope. Almost. I almost handled it. So the Ranger handbook, this is the larger one. My camera's sitting on my small one. The infantryman's Bible is about this thick. Okay. The only difference, the Ranger handbook basically steals all of the infantry stuff, the infantryman's Bible, the Ranger Handbook steals that. Okay, they're all the same. Battle drill, battle drills one through the Rangers use four or five. Well, we have eight. They're all the same. It's the same freaking thing. And then the Ranger Handbook, uh, what they'll add are things like mountain operations, mounted. Well, we got mounted patrol. Well, that's in there. Chapter nine. It's all your mountaineering stuff. The Ranger Handbook, that's where my protractor is. The Ranger Handbook adds the mountaineering stuff. Okay, that's not going to be in the 7-8 or the 3-21.8. Uh, I think there's demo in here. Um, the infantry, we don't we don't have demo in there. That's going to be in our engineer books. So, yes. Oh, and the Ranger Handbook has this aviation crap. Not to learn how to fly, but they need to know how to load uh, helicopters and shit um so do grunts but anyway yes i wouldn't say it's common sense but 
when you study this shit and if you go outside and practice it, you'll see that it's it's not common sense, but it's it's not complicated. It's not genius at all. Uh oh, almost. Does that count? My hand got close to it, so the freaking AI is gonna catch on to that. I handled it. Am I handling it? <laughs> Fucking stupid. Um, yeah, so you know, infantry tactics, uh, and they're old too. We we just refine them every century or so. Nothing special. The main thing is I tell people like I, I did a live thing a couple nights ago and I had to go to Rumble because I got booted from YouTube for a bit. But uh, you've got to practice this stuff. You've got to go out and do it. And I have some videos coming. We're going to we're going to go through battle drills and stuff and we're going to have fun with it. It's not going to be the typical YouTube military stuff. Um, but we're going to have fun with it. Go over battle drills and tactics and stuff and. I'll, I'll mention it many times. It's nothing special. Um, actually, you know, the, the stereotype is that grunts are dumb. I will admit I'm not the brightest guy, but a lot of, but good grunts, you know, in my experience, they've been the smartest dudes in the military because they can, they can think on their feet and they don't need the army doctrine and regulation bullshit. They're like, okay, give me the gist of it. Give me that tiny little book to study. And give me some guidelines and then leave me the hell alone and let me figure it out. That's most grunts. Your biggest re your biggest rebels in the military who are useful are going to be grunts. That's my experience. Grunts will make some shit happen. It's going to be a lot of illegal shit, but they're going to make it happen. Uh, DJ, you seen any cougars out there? Yep, all the time down at the saloon, dude. Um... They're, they're missing too many teeth. Ain't nothing truly predatory in the lower 48. You know, well, there's plenty of crazy motherfuckers in the woods. Those two-legged predators. Meth heads and legit deliverance hillbillies. That's why I carry out there. Ever been up to Canada? Nope, but I would love to. I think it's really cool. You guys are almost twice our size with a population of less than 30 million. That sounds awesome. <laughs> All right, the internet is dipping. I think it's about time to take a break. What do you guys say? Yep, humans are dangerous animals. Let's take a break. And to the people who didn't like the girlies, we're going to share some girlies.
is still kind of dipping in and out, but we'll continue. If you guys didn't know, uh, I do the breaks and then I just sit here. Yeah. So <laughs> watch the dancing girls with you. So with the YouTube firearms handling, does that count like noise? Like if I just play with my gun under the table, will that count? Because it showed me a timestamp of when they uh, when they were mad at me and dropped the live stream. And looking at the timestamp, the video was gone, but I could just estimate that it was around the time when I was cleaning it, not when I was holding it up and all that. So maybe there was a delay in the AI or the people reporting me. Um, we're going to talk about this with my next guest, too in the next live stream tomorrow. But I'm pretty sure a lot of his followers helped get him in trouble. And I'm pretty sure uh, when I get a video demonetized, it's um, partly people who follow me. Because there's, there's a lot of estrogen out there, guys who can't stand dudes doing things. And instead of moving along with their lives, they have to stay in touch. That's extremely feminine. That's what women do. Do we have any ladies in here? Like two of y'all. <laughs> but you know what I mean? When I act feminine, my wife calls me out on it. And she should. Because I shouldn't be acting feminine. Sometimes she'll ask if I had soy that day. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm surprised to see all the seer challenge questions. That's pretty cool. That's been a great a great percentage of the, the talk here. That's pretty cool. I assumed most of y'all weren't interested. Uh, that's one reason I moved it to a different channel. <clears throat> yeah, but, um, you know, the biggest complaint and the most requests I've seen are people want to see their favorite survival YouTubers out here. And... I'll mention it again, but, um, <clears throat> you know, not to dump on these guys like the YouTube survivalists and bushcrafters, they do really entertaining stuff and all the big ones are big for a reason, but, um, <clears throat> and I've reached out to them just to, just for the name, the name of them, that would, that would definitely help with the popularity, but, uh, um, the the few who responded to me uh know that they won't fit in that well and then most of the other ones they they don't respond at all it's either because it's too small of a channel grunt proof is too small um or one of them straight up asked how much i was going to pay him <laughs> so you know but survival is totally different from seer survival is a component of seer but we're talking about military evasion survival. Okay, so all these bushcraft camps, that ain't happening. You're, you're going to give yourself up. Um, even a, what we call an, a survival fire, I think you guys called a Dakota fire pit. The, the, there will be smoke, there will be smell, and with now the Op 4 has thermals and other optics. We got thermals in the air. <clears throat> that heat signature will be seen a mile away, and they're done. <clears throat> so the next one, if anybody's interested, um, the next one, there will be some some forced overnighters for sure besides the OP. So the OP, we, we made them go out there and do extra tactical work and sleep outside. Um, we haven't had one yet where people had to actually survive out there. <clears throat> Tom, you were watching it 40K. Wow, that's cool, man. Good to have you. Uh, yep, it was about 45,000K when Season 1, the survival games, the first year challenge started. So I didn't have enough pool to get an audience on that. <clears throat> Freedom by me. What's up, man? Yeah, but uh, Seer 4 is going to be special. I know I say it every year, and I, I think I've delivered every year. 
I, I told everybody we'd ramp it up for sure in Seer 3, and we did. Seer 4 is going to be very cool, and uh, even most of the bad guys don't know. They're going to get their own op order, different from my HQ guys, different from the contestants. Um, and it's not to be a dick. I know uh, the op four is going to get mad at me, and they're going to be mad at Stoker because he's going to be their boss. <laughs> and he's going to he's not going to get everything to give to them in the first place. But uh, <clears throat> they're going to be left in the dark because I, I really want to make sure they go through some serious planning. And they're also going to capture that on camera. So they're going to they're going to capture their their op orders they're doing on the bad guy side. They're going to capture their patrols a lot more. And you'll get to see really how they're trying to do their thing to catch the guys. So it's going to be different. It could possibly end up being easier in one component, one category under Seer, but it could also be tougher, depending. Uh, Christina, hey, thank you. Hi, finally caught a live. How y'all doing? Love the info in your vids. Cool. Appreciate it. So that's one lady. How many other ladies we got? My wife's going to get jealous now. One of my buddies was was talking shit. He's like, you don't have to worry. He's got all dudes watching him. I'm like, well, what if I get drunk enough? You might have to worry. <clears throat> Sear was up against NFL a couple times. Yeah, I think... Uh, I think the last episode of every season has been on the, the Super Bowl day. And season three, whatever episode was on the Super Bowl day, actually had the highest amount of live views than the rest of the season. I can't remember if it was the last episode or second to last. But that was pretty cool because, you know, some of the other guys are like, well, you're trying to compete with the NFL, you know, what are people going to do? And I'm like, well, they're going to fucking do what they want. They can watch it later. But it was cool to see the the live views were the highest on that day compared to the other episodes. That was pretty, that was pretty cool. And Seer 4, the contestants will be forced to wear Crocs. Could be. Yeah, there will be some interesting stuff happening going to be a, a new scenario you know i know brent likes to put on his costume and play he's gonna he's gonna get to do that but it's going to be in a different kind of setting and i think i'll have fun with it either way <clears throat> oh we got modern frontiersman in here with his trademark rainbow flags what's up man you want to join We're bullshitting. Q&A and bullshitting. Looks like we're running out of questions. I'm happy to be answering uh, Seer questions. That's pretty cool. Season 38. <laughs> Seer might get big enough for a Blackhawk. You know, I've been trying to get some air assets and it's uh, tough on the civilian side. Yeah, you know, can't just request helicopters. I well, I am in touch with a pilot who could do something for us. Um, it's a matter of the civilian airspace, you know. As it turns out, uh, it's hard to just get freaking, you know, helicopters and shit. So that's kind of the downside of being a low budget, just grunt doing stuff like, uh, you know, all these survival shows and everything where they got people jumping out of planes and shit. You know, the, the budget there, that's that's a serious Hollywood budget, and they don't make money off of it, by the way. So, like, people kept telling me to watch Alone. Oh, that's realistic. Okay, well, I went and watched it, and there's a lot of fake shit in it. Um, interesting show, but there's a lot of staged fake crap. But, um, yeah, though those networks lose money on those shows. They pump They pump millions into those shows and still lose money. 
I don't have millions to throw at mine. If I did one day, hell yeah. Get a C-130, push the guys blindfolded out of it, fuck them. Is the Huey crew from One Shepherd 40th available? You know, that's a good point. I should ask Donk. I've uh, congregated with him enough on Brent's channel. Maybe I should reach out. Might be a good idea. <laughs> so I saw a non-seer question. But it's gone. Sorry. So Josh says, if I'm on Seer Challenge, we all beat me and try to make me give up Intel. Yeah, dude. Of course. It's going to be a Seer Challenge. Tom and Clinton got it really bad. But you don't have to beat people. That's the thing. I didn't get beat in my course. Oh, we got we got slapped a couple times. I think I got kicked in my stomach doing push-ups. But uh, the beating is, you know, any man can take a beating, especially if you're in the military. It was the cold water that really hurt me, just like Tom and Clinton. Cold and wet sucks. You know, and then you don't get to sleep because of the music and lights and stuff. Like, it all sucks. Yeah, Freedom by Me, um, there's a ton of really useful, adoptable footage, yeah. You know, the thing is, um, I've considered putting some stuff in there, but I, I do want to keep it as legit as possible, you know. So, I, I would rather people be unimpressed by things rather than putting a bunch of shit like that in there. And then a lot of people are mad because they're like, oh, well, it is Hollywooded, you know, so, you know. I, I did embellish some things, but really just to kind of help with the story. It's like nothing major, nothing significant, nothing worth bragging about. But, you know, I don't want to have people, you know, get turned off by stuff. Otherwise, I've put freaking AC-130s in there gunning down the whole freaking area. Do you feel that SEER 100 is enough or should all soldiers go to some type of SEER even in the simplest of fashion? No. Seer 100 is a joke. It's an absolute joke. It's an online course. I don't even know if they do it anymore. It was an online course we had to do. It was a ridiculous amount of time spent on a computer going through, you know, vignettes and stupid crap. And it was a check the block course. So you cover the army tap code. That's, that's a good thing to know. But if you're sitting there, it's just like on YouTube. If you're sitting there watching something on a screen, how well are you learning it? You know, you got to go practice the stuff. So like the army tap code, dude, you got to, to even know the grids on where the letters are. You've got to practice that all so much to where you can memorize all those. And even in my course, and then later when I would practice it, I still didn't know it enough. Um, they go through signaling, which you have to go practice. You have to go set up signals to actually remember how to do it when it comes to it. Um, all the survival stuff, you know, you might recall one or two things from sitting there watching an online course, but it's a waste of time. And, you know, in the infantry, we used to practice that stuff. We used to add basic survival stuff to training whenever we could. And if you had good leaders from the light world or from the ranger world, what rangers used to be heavy on the stuff, but they quit because uh probably midway through the global war on terror rangers 100 percent lost the wood line and advanced guard tradecraft and they just went to direct action rangers used to be you know airfields and open spaces and stuff and maybe direct action and neo ops but they just they just cut everything and went to direct action just kicking in doors and and either shooting or arresting people so they dropped a lot of their field craft 
but uh ranger leaders i i had on my platoon in the early days they would teach us some really cool stuff you know and it wasn't anything fancy it would just be like hey guys we're we got some extra time we're gonna do some hip pocket training is what we called it so it's like when you have white space on the calendar or time to fill instead of sleeping or playing video games you know a, a good leader will take you outside and be like hey guys we're gonna do an hour class on this and go through it you know so we would have good leaders like um my first squad leader who got killed in ramadi he was really good about that he would teach us all kinds of stuff and enforce stuff <clears throat> that uh you know our our upper command wasn't pushing down on us so you have like your 72 now 72 plus infantry tasks that you should be proficient at as a grunt and so that's what your command is always forcing down hey in this year, we're going to hit all 72 tasks on the individual and the collective level. And then <clears throat> any free time, a good leader is going to take guys off to the side and be like, hey, we, we got some time. Let's let's work on this. And so then you become a better all around grunt. But uh, GWAT, man, it kind of kind of freaking ruined a lot of that. Guys got really spoiled. We got. We got into the fob mentality to where you always get to come back to a safe place at night or after a couple of days. There's always water to drink. You don't have to worry about food. You know, we got really spoiled. Oh, there it is. Uh, is there a place in shit hit the fan for now combat types or people that can do stuff like wage cyber warfare? What do you mean for now combat types? You mean non-combat types? But yeah, there's there's always a place for cyber warfare dudes. That's a big deal right now. Yeah, there's some pretty good, uh, well, there's some decent survival channels on YouTube. Uh, a lot of it, I think, is embellished, and I get it. They're, they're doing stuff to to get the views and make money. You know, that's what we all do. But I I got some videos in the pipeline on the survival stuff that, that most survival people are going to friggin' hate. And a lot of you guys are probably going to hate. Because... <laughs> I'm going to go through like shit that actually happens and like shit I deal with, man. Like we're just coming out of our last winter storm. Dude, I wasn't carrying half the shit these other survivalists worry about. I wasn't worried about half the shit. I had jeans on, you know, and I'm in freaking blizzards. And my, my common methodology that will piss the YouTube survivalists off is... I don't need to do mud huts and all this shit and carve spoons and everything. And if I am healthy and fit, I can walk my ass out there. That's it. That's my survival method. Walk the freak home. I don't know why I said freak, but I, I can walk my ass home. If I'm severely wounded, I'm setting the biggest freaking campfire imaginable. And it's going to look like a wildfire. If it turns into a wildfire, great. I'm getting rescued or I'm, or I'm burning myself up. Either way, the problem is solved. But, um, you know, I had buddies in the Air National Guard all the way back to the Berlin Brigade days, you know, the, the great, the, the Berlin Wall days. And they would tell me about the Vietnam SEER training they, they got. And they're like, dude, we were taught in the Vietnam days to just set the whole village on fire. That'll attract the attention of the right people. And it's, that's how I look at it. I mean, dude, if I can walk. Why am I building mud huts and carving shit and wasting energy building building stuff? It's a waste of energy and it's a waste of time. If I can walk, I'm walking home or I'm walking to a place to get safe. Never had any survival training in the Marine Corps. Yeah, I, I think you guys are really lacking on that. I was talking to Brent about that one time and he said they were also just sucking but, you know, you got the, like I said, you've, you've got the top-down approach, like your command. 
is driving your training. So they put off the training schedule. Like we need to focus on, uh, like for the army, it's set. It's last I looked, it's like 72 tasks, individual tasks. So under each one are all these subtasks. So total, you've got over 200 freaking micro tasks you should be able to do as a grunt. Um, so the command is driving the training, building that throughout the year. This is all the shit we got to focus on in the year. And it's kind of like with America, you know, I think we need to focus shit on the lower level. Like when I became a team leader, anytime we were bored, I would grab my dudes and we would do something. And we would do something that I wanted to do that I think they needed to know how to do. And it, a lot of times it wouldn't even match our yearly training schedule. And platoon sergeant or first sergeant would come out. Hey, what are you guys up to? And I'd be like, well, uh, you know, we're going over this. Uh, we haven't covered this, so we're going to do this. They're like, okay, cool. You know, and they go back in and then stragglers start coming out. They just start sending dudes out. Hey, there's some good training going on. Get out there. Um, I, I think that shit needs to be pushed from the lower level. If you got a, if you got a team leader that's not actively trying to teach you stuff, you got a shit team leader. If he's on his back or playing video games during the duty day, he's not a leader. And don't get me wrong, I gave my guys downtime. We we would go to the gym or do something else, but, you know, extra training is good. And if you're in the grunt world, you should want that. You should want extra training. I'm all about daytime naps, and when I was in the grunt world, hell yeah, you better believe we took some naps when we could. But if we're in a garrison environment, garrison is the easy – Infantry garrison life is probably the easiest job you will ever have because you're like a firefighter. You're, you're just waiting on something to happen, doing nothing. And just like firefighters, everything you are doing is just killing time. It's just to justify your paycheck. That's all it is. So when infantry guys in before the wars would complain about painting rocks and doing all this area beautification details, you know, I, I was lucky, uh, you know, my squad leader who got killed later, he, he taught me a valuable lesson. He was like, you know, he's like, if you're, it's because he was married, but he's like, if you are bored, somebody will find something for you to do. So why don't you stay busy with things that you want to do and then nobody will ever fuck with you again? And so I took that lesson as a freaking private under him, even though I wasn't in charge of anybody. So when I did get some leadership roles, I would think about that. If we were bored and taking naps, laying on our back, especially in garrison where you're not doing anything anyway, I'd be sitting there like, you know, in the next five to 10 minutes, a platoon sergeant or first sergeant's going to come up onto this floor and they're going to see us doing nothing and they're going to find something for us to do. And it's probably not going to be shit that we want to do. And it might not even be good training. It's just going to be crusty old platoon sergeant shit that they make up for us to do just because back in my day that's what happened to them so i would whenever i would realize that i'd be like uh guys let's go out and do some friggin' room clearing drills you know or let's go do some battle drills battle drills fucking bat like you know people ask about infantry tactics you know the grunts are only good at that stuff because we practice it non-stop all the friggin' time battle drills React contact, break contact, react, react to ambush, near and far, you know. Um, dismounted and mounted la land navigation. Pfft. Epic skill that you can never practice too much. And they're perishable skills. They go away fast. I wish this thing would scroll for me. Freaking, freaking frack thing. <clears throat> Life as a medical professional as well, you know, especially during those COVID times when the the hospitals were over, over full. I went to mine because I was bored and I went and checked with one of the dudes I knew. I was like, hey, man, what's your ICU look like? He's like, dude, we got we got four out of five empty beds. I'm like, huh. I'm like, you guys aren't all overcrowded and people dying. He's like, no, dude, we're bored as shit. 
That's the thing about the COVID thing. You know, the justification for shutting shit down, one of the justifications was, um, well, we have to take the burden off hospital capacity. Well, okay, my first question would be, wait a minute, didn't Obama fix all this with the Obamacare and healthcare for all in 2012? What happened to all that money? What happened to all that funding? What happened to some of my buddies paying $4,000 a month to healthcare for their family? Where'd all that money go? We didn't build up capacity with that back then. We didn't fix the healthcare system then. Sounds like bullshit. Or as George Carlin would say, smells like bullshit. Uh, Penn and Teller would say that too. You guys remember that show from Penn and Teller? Bullshit. That was a good show. They did gun control too. Um. Uh, what made you join the army, dude? Boredom. 19-year-old boredom, being a loser, not doing anything with life. When are you going to set up your own local DMR repeater? I have a repeater. I have a GMRS repeater up. How many tours did you serve? Well, we don't really count them that way, but I did two to Iraq, one to Afghanistan, and then I was in, doesn't it's not a deployment, but I was in Europe uh, a whole bunch. Those were fun times. <clears throat> In future SEER Challenge, will Survivor have a World War II spy-style radio to communicate with the motherland to get real live intelligence? Hmm. Uh, what kind of radio? S send me a link or something. Sounds cool. Uh, we do have some ideas for this because... I don't know if you guys caught the, the comms chat with Jared last night, but uh, we're going to up the Op 4 even more because uh, they're going to be in the dark even more. So everything is just it's going to be friggin' confabulated. We're definitely going to mess with everybody more, but we're going to we're going to enable the Op 4 a hell of a lot more. And so we're going to work on how we can help the guys out in the field more without compromising them. So like in, in season three, we kind of did it in phases, which is how like the school goes and everything. So I'm trying to figure out a way to get out of the, the school programming and, and just be create more creative with it. Um, so instead of going in like a linear fashion with the components, you know, survival, evade, survive, evade, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm trying to have more fun with it and open things up. So that's going to mean, the op four has a lot more freedom and I'm not going to be, I don't really, I didn't really constrain them this time, but I want them to just, just to be bad guys. So it'll kind of be like a field training exercise. The bad guys will have their op order and they're going to go operate and I'm not going to be helping them at all. They're not going to know the overall picture. It's just going to be like, here's the op order scenarios. What's happening. Go, go be bad guys, go accomplish your mission. So hopefully that motivates them to actually accomplish their mission. Hopefully they're going to want to be good grunts in that scenario. <clears throat> and then, um, so on that note, we're not, <clears throat> you know, like this last time, the whole spying on our radios and all that, like we talked about this in the live chat, but the op four cut that out and I wish they wouldn't have, I, they could have just, it was kind of silly, you know, they could have just been like, Randall, are you okay with us spying on your radios? And I would have been like, yes, continue. Uh, for some reason, I, you know, I knew they were doing that. And I assumed they would do it. So the whole time we were operating, I assumed it was happening. And then one of the guys slipped it to me that they were doing that at the OP phase. And I was like, okay, cool. Awesome. I expected that. Knowing Jared, a combo dude was coming out. I expected them to i expected them to have our frequency frequencies from the beginning and just be involved in everything but 
for whatever reason, they they cut it out and then never conferred with me. That was I thought that was kind of silly. Um, so you know, we talked about it after that. I'm not I'm not bitching about it, but this is just what happened, you know. So they could have conferred with me, and I was said like, yeah, keep fucking spying, dude. Um, but Brent had a good point. He said that they wanted to they wanted to try their own skills at the evasion portion first and then up their, you know, their cheating. You're always cheating in battle anyway. So when we all, when we all talked about it toward the end, you know, that, that made sense. And I was like, okay, cool. But I was like, well, still you could have fucking told me, you know, cause it's not like, I'll, it's not like I'm on the opposing team, you know, I'm the fucking dickhead. That's just, holding the camera sometimes and coordinating shit and what the good guys and bad guys do. I don't give a shit as long as it looks good on camera. So yeah, I, I, I told them that was kind of silly to, to treat me like I was an opposing force to them. Cause I'm like, well, it's kind of, it's kind of cool if the, the creator of the show, the dude running shit knows what's happening, you know, <laughs> but I was smart enough to assume they were doing that anyway. So when it was leaked to me, I was like, yeah, all right, cool. Good. I knew Jared would try something, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, they're going to have to use that shit. All, all the cool gadgets and every single little cool skill, you know, Brent will probably watch this eventually. So good. I hope you're taking notes, Brent. You guys are, you're going to fucking step it up next time. Cause I'm going to make you, you, you're not getting shit from us. Uh, Stoker's going to have your op order. And he's going to give you what I give him and that's fucking all he gets. And that's all you get. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to fucking hunt those dudes for real. There was a lot of babysitting, a lot of Intel updates for the op four. It ain't going to happen this time. So let's see how, I, I think they're going to use their grunt skills and I think they'll perform well because Fuck, dude, the level of experience they have, you know, Stoker, Brent, uh, Jared's a smart guy for being a Navy guy. He's very smart on the ground. And then Raven, he's a smart dude in the woods. So for the level of skill they have, I think they'll be okay. And I think it'll be impressive, but I'm curious to see how their, their, their cheats and the technology will pay off. And I think it'll be, and again, it's not Randall fucking trying to, you know, I, I'm, I'm out of the event. I really don't give a shit who wins. I have no stake in it. I just want it to be entertaining and get good video of it to make it entertaining for you guys. PK, take care, man. Thanks, dude. Miles, how's it going, man? Appreciate it. Let's create a SEER workup program. Yeah, that'd be fun. You know, I was working on uh, opening a course for that <clears throat> where we teach people this stuff. And I'm still trying to kind of figure out the details. <clears throat> it's doable. It's the it's the logistics and getting people to come. That's the problem. Not too many people are excited about paying to go get captured and put through miserable conditions because, uh, you know, just like the survival courses people have gone through, they have to immerse you in it to make it real. Like I know guys who have been to the initial Pathfinder course and they've said good things. They're like, yeah, dude, they actually, they teach you the shit. They actually take you in the woods and they make you do it all. So you, you either get your fire going or you don't and you're fucking cold at night, you know? So you, you have to be an immersed to truly appreciate your training. And, um, with the seer thing, we're, we're going to have to immerse you in it. We're not just going to put you in a chair and say, all right, well, here's the point where the guy's going to slap you in the face and hook electrodes up to you and, pour cold ass water on you when you've already been freezing for the last 30 hours. Like, no, we're going to fucking do it to you. <laughs> so as it turns out, just like I yell at people for not wanting to get fit, there's very, it's a small minority of people who actually want to deal with that shit voluntarily and pay for it. 
I know there's crazy assholes out there, but uh, my my wimpy little YouTube channel and and the reach I have, it's it's not big enough to get you know enough of those people out. Uh, and then I also got to fly the dudes out to help me run it. <clears throat> you know, survive the survival game seer season one, we ran that with three dudes. So it's possible to do a course with minimal, um, uh, personnel on the ground. But, uh, I just, af after season two, I really like having like a, a bigger staff. That was cool. Cause you know, I like, I'm not really a part of it. It's kind of a bummer. I, I try to get out and do what I can. And like the last one, I wanted to be on the ground a hell of a lot more, but I've, I messed my knee up the first major day. Like when those got captured, when the guys got captured, I fucked my knee up. So once they hit the field, I didn't get to go have fun, man. It's kind of a bummer. You know, the first two seasons I got to be out in the woods a, a hell of a lot. And I was away from my own flagpole that I create, <laughs> like our our pogue float, our support truck. Uh, it's necessary. It's great for our our talk and our comms, but I can't stand being in it because it's too constraining. You're in a slow ass truck, you know. You're a big target. You're screwing with radios and trackers. Like I'd rather be on the ground in the woods. <clears throat> What was your closest shave in battle and what did you learn from it? Shave? Dude, we don't shave in battle. Do you still do those motivational rants? <laughs> what are we doing now? Am I not yelling at fat people enough? <clears throat> Stoker's skill is incredible. Yeah, Stoker is... Uh, he, he's a badass man. <clears throat> and what's cool is um, sometimes you see his first sergeant personality, like it'll come out. But for the most part, he's, he's you know, a really quiet dude. And he's like just the guy that just kind of sits back and observes. And that's pretty cool. You know, of course, uh, in, you know, he's talking about in his videos because he's got a camera on and he's talking in his videos. It'd be silly if you put up a 30 minute video only talking for five minutes of it. But yeah, hanging around him is is pretty fun because sometimes like planning shit with him, all the seer challenge planning shit. He's hot shit on that. Absolute, uh, you know, first sergeant experience level shit going on. <clears throat> and I'm a dummy. So a lot of the shit I'm like, dude. Look at this. Look at my op order. He's like, yep, you suck. You know, or or what do you think about this shit? And he'll just like, uh, I'll throw out a scenario and he's just like, boom, 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 boom. Courses of actions out the ass. Like, well, look at these. <clears throat> and then he's he's he kind of gives me the impression. He's like, leave me the fuck alone till you go through all these yourself and then talk to me. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of like the first Sergeant Stoker coming out. But yeah, he's a cool dude, man. Very helpful out here for this stuff. Uh, like he he ran the op four last time and all the interrogation shit. I would basically just peek my head in on my crutches, you know, chit chat with him a little bit, have some fun, get some video. But he ran all that shit. Him and Brent, and he's kind of the mastermind. Um, season four, I think, will be interesting. It'll probably show off the op four. A lot more. So season three had the op four showing off of the interrogation and all the abuse they could do and how brutal it can be and how mean they can be and how long they can keep up characters. Like that was impressive. But I think these season four, I think they'll they'll get to show off their tactics because they're gonna have to. Like if they call me and ask me shit, I'm gonna I'm not going to talk to him. I'm going to talk to Stoker. That's how it's going to be. <laughs> I'm forcing a chain of command so people leave me the fuck alone. Yeah. Biggest obstacle to a course would be the insurance. Yep. Um, I do have a liability and I have a lawyer look at the SEER challenge stuff every year and that's already expensive enough just to have somebody look at it.
Well, Alpha Ranch, um, go to the website and put in an application, dude. You'll be number seven. I'll share it again real quick. We got eight people that's put in so far, and that's that's actually a lot for how early we are. Season two, we had 11 people, and then Jared beat out Brent, or we, we had Brent set, and then Jared beat out the other tw uh, 10. Uh, and that was like summertime we decided that. So it's it's growing in applications. That's cool. And we just got to narrow down, you know, who 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 would be the best, who would be a good fit, who's going to fit with the other person, uh, who we're not going to really want to choke. So there you go, Alpha. Oh, that's a good one. Um, an SF guy told me once that what makes SF so awesome and good is that they train so much on the simple soldier task that they're just instinct that allows them to further their skills. Yep. hundred percent, man. Um, we'll leave it up. So I would always talk to my Joes about this and I'm just sinking in my chair. Eventually I'm going to fucking fall off the camera. But I talk about this in videos too. A lot of people want to impersonate what these tactical dudes are doing in their YouTube videos without knowing the context and without understanding why things are done. So let's take the tactical shooting. That's the YouTube sexy stuff right now. Just throwing lead down range from 50 meters and then, you know, going to the bar. Looks cool. How fast can you pull your trigger? How many rounds can you put down range? Looks cool. It makes videos work. They get their views. They get paid. They get their sponsors. But so what the audience sees is a dude who can mag dump into steel targets within a minute. And they're like, oh, yeah, badass. What they don't see is the thousands of hours of training that goes behind that one skill. You know, so I think a long time ago I did a a CQB video and just talked about some training and I talked about like muscle memory and how grunts train for thousands of hours. Like nobody fucking cared about it. It wasn't YouTube sexy. Uh, and I'll keep reinforcing that when it comes up, but you it's, it's for some reason it's got a negative connotation, like the basics and standard grunt skills. But I have, the only advanced stuff I ever did was when I was in sniper school and some of the hindsight missions I ran in Ramadi, which is like, they were like sniper missions, but we, we called them hide sites or hunter killer teams because we didn't, uh, we didn't do like a traditional sniper mission, like one, like a shooter and a spotter. We would go out in teams and we would sit where they just cleared an IED We'd sit in an overwatch position, a hide site, and we would observe that until the bad guys came to reseed, like put another IED in that spot. So sometimes it'd be three to seven days. We would we would just lay there on a roof or in the woods watching the site. And a lot of times nothing happened at all. Sometimes bad guy teams would show up and do their thing and we would do their thing. Um, other times we would go to ambush them, but they were waiting on us to hit them and then they would ambush us. So that's why we went out in teams, you know, in Ramadi, even out in the farmlands, you didn't want to be out with just a couple dudes because there's no stealth. As soon as you shoot out there, you're all stealth is gone. There's no escaping. There's no evading and shit. It's basically just a team of guys nowhere near in comparison. Don't get me wrong, but it's, it's similar to the Mac V stuff. You know, once they fired, they were compromised and had to get the hell out of there. The only difference is we would be dealing with like, you know, I don't know. I never counted the dudes, but probably max, max 15 people shooting at us. Max. Maybe less than that. Whereas, you know, in Vietnam, they're talking about entire battalions and, you know, divisions coming after them. And, and they were very skilled people. So... Nowhere near comparing the two. I know somebody's going to misquote me on that, of course. 
But similar experience. Once, once we fired on the IED team, it was time for us to bug out. And that meant fucking throwing smoke, hand grenades and shit, distracting them, and then just getting the hell out of there to either back to the base or whatever little extraction point we had set up. <clears throat> We're going on two hours. And uh, old Brent 0331 can't go more than max two hours. He got mad at me last time because I told him he needed a break. He, he always needs a PP break. And he, and he cuts the live stream. I'm like, dude, just fucking take a break. Do what I do. Put titties up on the screen and take a break. I'm about to take another break here in a minute. <clears throat> Oh, geez. Miles, thanks, dude. I'll help whatever help you need. Uh, Yeah, well, we're good on help, man. I think you sent me an email a while back, so I appreciate it. When when I need uh, personnel, I'll, the YouTube members, you'll be the first to know about it. And, of course, we got to screen you guys. I get it. You, you pay for memberships and stuff, but we also got to make sure... You know what's what's the grunt proof channel membership? Uh, four ninety nine, two ninety nine for the grunt level. You could be a dude who wants to wear me as a as a mask, a dead skin mask, like the Slayer song, and and shell out the two ninety nine a month. So, uh, but it's also you know to make sure we got good dudes out there. Like, I can't house and feed people who aren't going to help but when when we need the help we'll reach out um dj who are you talking to typically start filming in november freedom by me you don't get that yet are you one of those grunts you just can't pay attention Yeah, the event happens in November because it's the best time to do it. And then whenever Grunt Proof gets his happy ass off the couch and starts editing the footage, uh, that's when the, the season starts airing. So I've, I've started airing them in February. Last year was the first time I got on it early because I just I, I came home and kicked ass really, really quick. So I think we started it in mid or late January. That was the and season three was a bitch, man. I'm not I'm not saying I'm a, I'm good at production, but you know for for all the stuff I have to work with and still living a normal life, season three was was really fucking tough. I'm damn proud of it, the production value, and I appreciate y'all pointing that out. But uh, it it hurt, man. It really hurt. There you go. See, grunt's doing grunt shit. That's um, we need to put out more basic skills content than high speed stuff. Yeah, dude, you know, and I get uh, I, I've I've seen a lot of stuff you do. It's it's pretty similar. Like I I get, you know, on YouTube you put out a, a beginner video or a four dummies video, and all the experts got to come into the comment and and adding all their two cents about all the advanced shit and i'm just thinking like dude if you're advanced and you're looking for advanced shit why are you on this video well it's because they're trolls pretty much or they're they're just so badass they got to come in the comments and tell us how badass they are i remember those days you know um but yeah i i will talk about basics all day freaking long and oh <laughs> My whole my whole sniper and Ramadi story. Thanks, Josh. I got off track because of that run of my mouth. The whole point to that was that was the only time in my career and in my life when I actually did advanced stuff from doing the sniper training to going up to the deployment and then actually on the deployment doing insane shit that very few people did in the GY era. 
Um, since then, I only do basics. I don't give a shit about how many rounds I can put down range. Like we will, when we train, we will simulate some suppressive fire, but like the, the tactical shit where they're fucking almost rapid fire. Uh, no, I don't do that. Um, I do basic land nav. It, it'll be long distance and all this stuff, like equivalent to what I did on expert infantryman's badge. Like the land nav course we did was pretty insane. Um, but I, I do basic shit, man. And I will only teach basic shit. If you want advanced shit, you can go somewhere and pay for it because you cannot, it's hard to learn basic skills through YouTube. So that's why I only talk about the basics. If I try to teach you advanced shit, you're, you're either going to yell at me because you don't understand it or because tactical Dan on the other channel did it. Um, or, or it's just going to be useless to you because advanced shit it's for people who are like extremely proficient. You know, most grunts, we never really count ourselves advanced at anything. Um, but we just kick ass because we are just experts at the basic shit doing grunt shit you know and grunts are good at everything outside of fighting too i noticed with the soft boys i work with them a lot in afghanistan they're they were fucking big old cry babies um they're they're overwatch guys and snipers they would do ops and and get out there and suck but all the rest of those dudes they were crying. If they couldn't get back to the base that night, the fob to get their green beans and shit, they were fucking crying. They just want almost like the SF mission is by whistling through um, village stability operations. That's the traditional soft mission. And just like the Rangers, they all got into direct action shit, kicking in doors and going home. So when they got stuck somewhere out in the field and they didn't want to sleep outside, guess what? And why didn't they want to sleep outside? Because they carried three magazines apiece because it was direct action. Direct action. We're going to go hit this target and go home. Oh, shit. We don't have any more ammo. They're back at the trucks that are two miles that way. I ain't walking over there. Fuck that. You know, where's the, where's my fucking Kiowa? Come pick me up. Um, and also because they didn't bring anything else. It was like gear to go kick indoors and then go home. No snivel gear. No rain gear. None of that bullshit. And Afghanistan is tough with the weather. Iraq, you could get away with being caught out outside without snivel gear and rain gear. In Afghanistan, you'd fucking pay for it. So, yeah, I saw it plenty of times. There was four groups out there that we were working with. And every single one of them, they were a bunch of fucking crybabies. So, they were like, oh, well, the grunt should pull security. Or let's, let's get the Marines to pull security. We ain't fucking staying out here. So, guess what? I wasn't a grunt at the time. That was awesome. Um, but every fuck, every single time they find an IED on the road. Oh, well, we'll call, call QRF, call the grunts to pull security on it so we can keep going. SF doesn't sit on IEDs and wait on EOD to show up six hours later to come clear it. If nobody comes to relieve them in place so they can leave, they just fucking leave the site. And guess what? EOD doesn't like that. If you find a bomb on the road and you just leave it, that site is unsecured. So now they're pissed because EOD has got to roll up and try to clear that site and find the bombs without a team there. SF guys did that all the fucking time. They were the big, this ain't my job type dudes, you know, until it came down to direct action and I'd be messing with some of their guys. I'm like, well, that's not your fucking job either. You're not direct action. And they'd get all pissy. I'm like, what is your, what's your mission statement, dude? By, with, and through. And in Afghanistan at the time, it was village stability operations. So there was there was a lot of guys doing that. Small units living out there in the villages, just absolutely sucking. So I know somebody's going to get butt hurt. Well, this guy says all SF were pussies in Afghanistan. No, there was a lot of really good dudes doing good things all across the board. But generally speaking, the soft guys got spoiled because they always got a helicopter ride home or a convoy home. They never got stuck guarding IEDs for days. They never got stuck on target for days. And if they did, they could always ask for a ride home and they could pass it on to somebody else. So good for them. They went through their selection pipeline. They, they earned it. They got to pass shit on to us grunts, but 
Nobody fucking suffers in the field as much as grunts. Nobody gets as cold, wet, and tired as grunts. I don't fucking give a shit what school you've been to. Seals were the same way. We had Pat 4, Provincial Augmentation Team 4, led by Seals. I think the commander was a Marine Major. Um, all really cool dudes, but the SEAL guys were absolute fucking babies if they got stuck outside. They wanted to go kick indoors, shoot bad guys, arrest dudes, and go home. That's it. Sleeping outside, their sniper dudes were all about it. Um, if the guys were put into overwatch position, especially if they had javelins, they were happy about that because javelins are really fun to shoot at people in the mountains. But the rest of their team, they're like, fuck this, dude. We're kicking indoors and we're going home. So there was a massive shift for everybody. Everybody got spoiled in the GWAT era, grunts included, because we bitched when we got stuck out for more than a, a couple days. We got cold, wet, and tired. And we bitched when the internet didn't work or the internet cafe was closed or we didn't get to go to Surf and Turf Thursday, you know, um, or Taco Tuesday. Sometimes we had a steak and egg breakfasts. Dude, in a war zone, steak and egg breakfast. Hell yeah. And we would cry. We'd bitch and complain if we missed it one week, you know. So we all got spoiled. We all got spoiled over there and, and cried like little friggin' babies when we didn't get everything. <clears throat> Looking down on the basics is called arrogance. Yeah, I don't know where this negative connotation comes from. Nobody wants to practice basic stuff. Everybody wants to be Delta and shit. And it's like, all right, well, you know, most of the people I see acting that way refuse to understand that you fitness is number one. So you got to do step one to get to step two or any other steps. If you don't have step one fitness, none of the other steps matter. They're all irrelevant. So all the gear and as good as you can shoot and everything, if you're not fit, just cancel it all out because you still got to be fit to get to the fight and get your ass home. Miles, thanks again, man. I did my first five mile ruck. And the rain today, 35 pounds. Cool, cool dude. It's good shit. Cool. And 35 pounds, that's the standard grunt weight. I know everybody says we ruck with like 100 pounds of gear and shit. Like, that's stupid. Um, you only need to ruck with 20% of your body weight. I'd say max 30% max. But if you're starting off, 20% body weight is totally fine. Don't run. Just walk as fast as you can. Try to get... Try to do 15 minute miles and do that without running. And that that's your conditioning. That's your workout. That's everything. Toughens up your feet, prepares you for carrying your fighting load. Being on a comp in Afghanistan with only platoon size element was an eye opener for the cross training of all there. Learned so much out there. Plus, you, you, you learned how much was out of your control. Yeah, you know, controlled chaos. Yeah, those comps, man. I was there in Ramadi when we started those. It was fun times. On the bright side, uh, your flagpole's not there. Our our first combat outpost in Ramadi. It was out in the farmlands, and, and either route you took, whether it was Pacer or Sea Lake to get up there, it was it was death. Like, you were going to get blown up driving on that road. It was guaranteed. So my first sergeant was a punk ass. He never wanted to come up there. Uh, you know, speaking of leadership, the first sergeant I had with Alpha Company, 2-6 Infantry under 135 Armor in Ramadi, uh, Camp Blue Diamond, 2005-2006. If anybody can find the first sergeant from that day, I don't know his first name. His last name was Scott. He was a piece of garbage. You know, I couldn't even say his full name because I, I could get in trouble for doxing people. He was absolute garbage. Did not back us up at all. All the FOB police we had out there 
I've talked about it in the last couple chats, especially with Josh, all the garrison bullshit. He fucking came after me so much for standing up for my guys. Like, you know, Josh, we were talking about not being able to get into the chow hall because you're dirty. Well, we would tell those guys to eat bags of dicks too. And I would tell them, I, I would block the dude, send my guys in, be like, guys, go get some fucking food. And I would deal with the dude and usually miss my meal standing up for my guys like you're supposed to, you know, personal courage. It's an army value. It's an army leadership value. And then my first sergeant would be the first dude to come after me for it. And I'm like, I'd explain it to him. Like, look, we just came in off of our OP. These guys been out there for six days on a hot ass rooftop starving. We had five minutes to get to the chow hall so they could get some good warm food. And this clown, the file police, didn't want to let them in because they're dirty. Because we just got in from an OP. Yeah, they're dirty. We're in fucking war, dude. Let my guys eat. And, and, and then we'll go be pretty soldiers and clean up and everything. And guess what? The first sergeant get, didn't give a shit. He would, he would tear me a new one. He would threaten Article 15s. Uh, both Article 15s I got in my career were within four months from that same first sergeant. And it was all because of everything that happened downrange. He could not stand that I took the Army leadership values personally. I was like, well, personal courage to me means standing up against the enemy, but it also means standing up against shithead leaders in, in my own ranks, especially to protect my guys. So, yeah, stuff like that, man. So that first sergeant, uh, I found him on Facebook a long time ago before the Great Purge. And if I could, if I could meet this dude in person, and the thing is, he's such a fucking punk-ass coward. He wouldn't fight me. You know, I would have to attack him uh, to instigate it. And then I would just crush him, you know, but he, he would be that guy, you know, probably try to shake my hand like, oh, I'm sorry for everything that happened. But I'd be like, dude, I want to fucking, I want, I want to end you with my bare hands right now. Please attack me. He would just sit there, you know, yeah, absolute absolute garbage human being horrible nco useless first sergeant didn't do anything for us as a first sergeant the one time he came out to our combat outpost you know first sergeants are supposed to be about morale and shit beans and bullets and morale all he cared about was where we were putting our trash where our burn pile was and people not shaving we're in a combat outpost in ramadi and he's talking about people not shaving. My platoon sergeant was all. He's like, well, first sergeant with potable water. Um, so we have potable water. So I don't want my guys shaving with a razor with dirty ass Iraqi ditch water. You know, and he's like, oh, okay, well, we get we'll get you guys some of those electric shavers. You know, because that's such a fucking priority. It's like, no, get us some actual food out here instead of MREs. Get us some more bullets. Get us some more sandbags. Fucking, and he's like, well, we'll get you some electric razors so you can be clean shaven out here. And I'm, I'm looking at my platoon sergeant and I'm just like, yeah, fucking come on, man. Kill him. Choke him out. We won't turn you in. Choke him out. <laughs> I'm pretty sure our platoon sergeant would have killed him if he could, but. There's always one dude in a platoon that'll turn people in. I was not one of them. <clears throat> yeah, dude. Um, grunt's got to eat, man. Especially, dude, in Ramadi. Uh, my platoon lost uh, seven guys in my platoon. We lost um, 21. Yeah, a little like tw over 21 dudes in our task force. It was fucking bad, dude. You can ask Josh. We talked about it the other night. Ramadi was bad. Every day somebody was getting hurt or killed or both. It was just, it was horrible. So we had to keep up morale as much as we could. You know, in the summertime, you could go get blocks of ice to put in your ice chest to go out. We would be stealing that shit. Just breaking open freaking freezers early in the morning to steal that shit because the fucking the support pogues, the guys who are supposed to be supporting us, 
would ration it and keep us from it. We'd fucking steal that shit in a heartbeat. Like Josh said, they were stealing shit from our motor pool. We would steal parts from other people's motor pools to get shit running. You know? Um, yeah, we, we all turned into a bunch of fucking pirates to get the job done and protect each other, and morale was a big deal. I, I did everything I could to keep my guys happy and be a buffer between them and the bullshit. <clears throat> And, you know, the upper leadership, they can't handle that. Maybe that's why Brent's not in the comments. He's too high-ranking. He's 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 now part of the dick-sucking committee. It's all politics up there. So our company lost 17 Marines and sailors. Yeah, man. Bad times. So we had to do what we could to keep morale up and keep guys from offing themselves. And, um, Josh, you could probably say the same, man, but... Um, three guys that I knew from those days have ended their own lives since then. Two of them within the last five years. That's kind of crazy. So one guy did it uh, over 10 years ago, you know, and that, that was that was fucking hard. But two guys within the last five years. And that's when, um, you know, we're all talking about it. And we're like, dude, what the fuck, man? This was 20 years ago. W what's going on? And as it just turns out, man, it, it just, it fucks some guys up that bad. And so I'm not even in touch. I, I would say that number is higher, but I'm not even in touch with many of the guys, nor have I heard from them. We got one dude. He was totally the break glass in case of war type guy. Awesome freaking soldier. Saved my ass a couple times down there. But in Garrison, he was, he, he was the guy you just wanted to lock up. He was horrible. Fucking haven't heard from him since uh, he left. Nobody has heard from him, so he's he's probably he's probably not around. <clears throat> yeah, you guys had had a lot too, Josh. It was bad times, man. We didn't we didn't really get too deep into that into your talk. We, we'd have to do that again one day. You know what we should do is we should get a whole bunch of Ramadi vets around and just. Just bullshit about it. Like uh, Brent had a dude. Brent had a Marine sniper on that did the same mission as us, the hide site missions. And I was listening to his story. <clears throat> and I was <coughs> sitting there thinking about it. I was like, yep, uh-huh, remember that, yep. And he's talking about how the hide sites would go down. <coughs> <coughs> and how the tactics would keep changing and stuff. And I'm like, yep. I remember that. Yep. Um, let's see. I'm going to take another break. You guys want the girls or the snow quad? That's your only options. And I know people are going to complain. Three, two, one. Too late. You're getting the girls. I'll give you a different shot, though. And we'll be back.
countdown to nothing. So let's hear some ideas. What um that was the countdown thing. That was not the break thing. Forgot about that. What would you guys uh want to see for countdowns? Nobody else is doing the dancing girls, so you know it kind of goes along with the grunt themes. I never married a stripper, but I know dudes who did. You know those guys in the strip club. I never liked that shit. I was like, why be teased when I could just go get it? But uh, you know, go hang out with the guys. There was always that one dude that fell in love with the stripper and would just be paying her to sit next to him. And then at the end of the night, you know, he's like, "Oh, dude, she really likes me." I'm telling you. And we're like, "Dude, you spent a thousand dollars on you, of course, on her. Of course, she likes you." No, man, it's not like that. She she really likes talking to me. We're like, man, nah, okay. Next night, she's doing the same with another dude. <laughs> Joes. Joes are not smart sometimes. <clears throat> yeah, so if you got some ideas, I might throw them in. Somebody was asking uh, what happened the other night with um, the, the radio, so... You know, we're out in the woods down at the gate, like way the hell day in the, down there. I heard a uh, sound of like FM radio, some music. And I was like, um, yeah, okay, that's strange. It sounded like it was right at the gate. So I let Jared go walk down there. Nobody was there. Um, <clears throat> we, we've got some areas where they have found squatters before. You know, um, some of them have been shot. That's good. But, I mean, you know, it's a shitty situation. You know, people just looking for a place to go, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I thought it might have been one of those situations. So I put up the same drone that you guys saw in Seer 3. And <laughs> I put my spotlight on it. Well, I couldn't decide if I wanted to put a speaker on it. Oh, we can talk about gear. I'll show that to you guys. That's that's pretty cool toy, man. <clears throat> so this is the new toy for Seer 3 that some of the members helped fund so thank you guys y'all only funded about two percent of it so don't get ahead of yourselves it's a fucking expensive toy but this is a search and rescue the the quality on it. it it's like a seven or nine k freaking thing I, my computer can't even process it but the the thermal capabilities are insane on this so like two miles away you will pick up a freaking you know a fox or something walking through the woods you'll you'll pick it up you won't be able to zoom in to see it that far away but you will pick up that thermal signature and you'll pick up the movement so anyway I've got, uh, it's got a speaker on it because it's a search and rescue drone. So that's designed for the people looking for lost stupid hikers. And they go find them on a cliff or side of a ravine or something. And they're like, they can't get to them immediately. But the speaker is loud as shit, man. So in the Seer Challenge, Brent and all them, they're yelling at them through the speaker and everything. It's hilarious, <laughs> you know, because the contestants are sitting in this OP and they they hear it buzzing around they might see the lights from it and then they just hear like clear as day which sounds like a bullhorn yelling at them but from the sky you know so i like i like to mess with the the rednecks with this you know fly it around at night yell at people and stress them out and because it's loud and clear uh <clears throat> but you know it's the search and rescue aspect so they can find a hiker Hey, we, we see you. We see you down there. We will get to you. Stay put. That's what that's for. And then you've also got, there's other attachments on it. Like you can map an area with it. But then we also got this spotlight, like a little Johnny five looking thing. 
but this thing is insanely bright for how small it is and just from the drone powering it and it doesn't even kill the battery that much but this spotlight when i put it like you know way up in the sky it's dude I, I guarantee you the the hill people are thinking that's like the ufo freaking orb flying around because i can fly it high enough to where they don't hear the buzzing sound but they see this spotlight <laughs> you know so anyway last night i started flying this around to see what what the the noise was and everything and it wasn't in the spots where i thought so that's good but i've you know I, I did spot a, a camper out there hanging out at night. So <laughs> I went ahead and got a little lower and got around and I could see on the thermal thing. I, I could see them stand up out of their chair and start to look around. And I'm just like, Hey, you, Hey, you down there. And I could see them. They started waving. And I'm like, you having a good night, you know? And I'd see like another wave. And I'm like, okay, take care. So could this handle a payload? Absolutely. I mean, these, these things aren't light, man. These attachments, this is a, it's a couple ounces, you know, so it can handle the payload, but that, that's a, this is a fun toy and we'll break it out. I couldn't fly it too much and see her three. I was having some issues with it. Um, that was a bummer. Also being injured, not being so mobile and getting it where I wanted, but then we, we got a lot of rain and, I'm pretty sure it could fly in most rainy situations, but you know, I didn't want to destroy the new toy screwing around with it, but we were able to use it enough, enough to where the guys got captured. There you go. All right, what are we talking about? What do y'all want to talk about? You guys been around for a couple hours. It's getting late. Any more questions? It's either Randall or the PLA or Biden's regime. I'm cool with Randall. I just flip them the bird and laugh. Yeah, well... I just don't get so low that people could shoot it down. I am going to do a video on drone defense. So I did, I did two thermal defense videos. Um, those are actually doing pretty well. The first one bombed. I didn't think anybody cared about it. And then around 2020 ish, it got to over a million views very quickly. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But, um, What's today? Oop. Oh, okay. So in a couple days, I'm going to, I need some help with it, but in a couple days, I'm going to go, we're going to shoot a true thermal defense video. We're going to look at kind of the FPV style drones that we're seeing in Ukraine. And I'm going to try to shoot one down with a shotgun. Uh, you know, you got to try to hide from them. If you can't hide from them, they found you. Well, a shotgun is probably going to be your de best defense. So you guys will see that soon. Probably going to be, we got, we got 20 gauges. I like those. And then, uh, probably birdshot. It's probably your best bet. Buckshot, you know, it's good, but birdshot, you get a spread, more pellets and a big spread. So that's what we're going to do. So we'll talk. We'll talk about the uh, theory, um, and I'll start it at different ranges. And I'm not very good at clay pigeon shooting, so I'm not like an expert uh, bird shotgun dude. So it'll be a good average grunt video.
How good are those drones in the jungle? Why well, I, I would say mostly useless. You know, the Ukraine stuff has bought people into the idea that drones make or break everything on the battlefield. And I covered it on the Seer Challenge channel just to kind of help push the show if drones make the biggest difference. The problem in Ukraine is they're in such wide open area. There's nowhere for these guys to hide. <laughs> You know, even their their trench lines where they have, it's in these tiny little grow areas where the trees have been blown out and decimated. So there's really no overhead cover. Even if there is overhead cover, when you're in nothing but farmlands and you come to like a little grow area, you can almost guarantee there's going to be soldiers there. So you can just, you can sit there with the drone and hover until you see signatures and then you've got them. And you won't see any of that on these videos you just see the thing coming in to take them out or drop the grenades on them it's either that or you know these guys know where their lines are like brent has had a dude on an american dude that's been there so if you know where the enemy is the drone's not up all the time hovering it, th this isn't like military drone shit this is like dj mavic freaking drones you know retrofitted to handle payloads so they're like, okay, well, we're pretty sure there's dudes over there. Like the intelligence comes from the ground. Scouts or grunts reporting, hey, there's movement out there. And then the drone goes out there. So the drone knows where to go already and just basically has to catch the guys out in the open. The poor, sad dude who gets caught out in the open, you know, and if it's one of these FP, FPV suicide drones, he's got him, man. There's no chance. So as we've seen in the SEER challenge um, with the heavy canopy and the 3,200 acres these guys have to hide in, the drone doesn't have much of a chance. So, you know, uh, you can get 40 to 50 minutes out of each battery on this, depending on what you're doing. But unless you know where the guy exactly is, um, and there was even a couple times where I knew where the contestants were and I put it up and tried to get actual shots of them doing stuff i got nothing because they're crawling under this manzanita and it's just thick enough to where that drone isn't picking it up you know so uh in a jungle i could i could imagine it's pretty much useless you know maybe at night when it's all cooled off and if that guy just happens to come out of the triple canopy you know maybe if if you've got to know where the people are that's the key point so in Ukraine, they know where the guys are. They just have to fly the drone over there in the area where they know they are, and boom, they got them. But you you have to know where they are first. You, you're not just going to fly these things around, and the military doesn't do it this way either. You're not just flying these around randomly for hours, you know, looking for targets. It's like, okay, we've got intelligence. We've got this kind of area to look in, you know, hover around. Or fucking sit there and scan around, go like I'll go back and forth to get around the trees. Like, and I demonstrated this in one of the grunt proof videos not too long ago. I can't remember which one, but the camera I had issues, so I cut to just thermal footage toward the end. And I I clearly showed uh I think it was Stoker. We were out at one of our points, and Stoker was just walking between foliage and manzanitas and stuff. And you couldn't see a damn thing. You can see the outlines of the trees and everything, but you know, thermal, it's not like the movies. You don't just see through stuff like trees and shit. So you see the outlines of the trees and you see stuff, but you don't know there's a person there. And then Stoker would just casually walk out from under the tree, you know, and he'd walk to the next one. So yeah, if you know where the guy is and if I got grenades and shit, yeah, I can come down hit that tree and hopefully get him. But just spotting somebody that way and, and, one thing is people ask about umbrellas and stuff. That's not going to work because if it has a good sensor and if you're already in the area looking for something, you're going to see that moving object. So like I said, with, with a good thermal sensor, you're going to see the outlines of objects. It's either going to be hot or cold, but you'll see the outline of it. So like with the trees, you could clearly make out, yep, that's a tree. So if you're walking around out there with an umbrella, the, the sensor is going to pick up a circular object, whether it's hot or cold. It's going to pick up that object. 
And then you're going to see this little freaking circular thing moving. So it's like, oh, yeah, there's the dude down there with an umbrella. Blow him up, you know. <laughs> it's not... It, the drone stuff is... Uh, like I said, with, with the Ukraine stuff, it's overplaying it way too much. And I'd love to have a dude on here who was a drone operator there to back that up. But uh, me being as good as I am with them, you know, like I'll tell you, you have to know where the people are first. Otherwise, you're just scanning an area. And yeah. But again, you know, they're out there in these wide open farmlands with small grows dispersed through them. And it's like, well, which grow are the guys in? Well, probably every single one because that's where the friggin' lines are. You know, so it's like, well, we got guys in these drones or in these groves fly out to, to these grows. And then when a dude pops out, there you go. Got him. So Josh says, every night in Ramadi through thermals, I would see an old shepherd walk by my posy, posy position. You guys say gay words like that too, posy? With his sheep, he would always stop and wave at me. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you guys have the dudes that tried to crawl through their sh their sheep herds to get to your OPs? Oh, post. Okay. Yeah, he's trying to cover it up real quick. I'm not gay. <laughs> I was in my camis out of my OP posse. Oh, you're asking why I don't have a southern accent. Like, I did. I, I could show you videos of when I was a kid. Yeah, I grew up, born and raised in Mississippi, man. I, I had an accent, and somewhere I lost it. People tell me when I get drunk, it comes out. But, I don't know. I learned how to talk, man. You know what I like is uh, when, when Tom was out here for the Sear Challenge, fucking British. British cannot say words that end in A. They can't. So, like, tomato be tomato, like us. They they just they can't end a word with an A. It's always going to be a er. Social media. Go listen to Brits when they talk. Social media. It's like, dude, they they give us shit and say we can't we butcher the language, but we don't add an er to a words. Rednecks do. We'll say tomato, potato, tater, <clears throat> but we don't. Yeah, worse worse your ass, man. Go worse your twat. Yeah, drones, drones are a tool, okay? Just like everything else. It's nothing special like military-grade, high-speed shit. It's going to do some damage. But go look at the at Afghanistan footage. You'll see the Predators and shit and, and the Apaches. They're circling these mountains, and they got the best stuff. And you'll see their targets just disappear behind trees. That's why they're circling so the predators, they have to circle because they're fucking planes. But you'll see helicopters and inspectors, you know, they're they're circling to, to continually get a better view. And like the AWACS, the AWACS helps a lot with that. <clears throat> the radar planes, because they have thermals too and all these high-speed sensors. And what they'll do is they will they will generate an image from all directions into one image. So if you've got a dude behind a tree or under a tree and they have to get a circular view to pick up that signature, the AWACS can generate an image to estimate where that person actually is, no matter where the sensor is. So it's kind of like if you had 100 cameras from different angles and just put them all into one image. That's what the AWACS, AWACS can do. So like a lot of our sat images and shit, that's the kind of stuff we would get. Um but still, you have to know where the people are. You have to know where those thermal signatures are. Otherwise, you're just looking at hot and cold mountains and trees. And it's like, all right, look at the wide field of view of 40 freaking miles and look for movement. Well, you know, there's animals out there. There's cars driving around. There's all kinds of shit going on. Oh, thanks, Miles. What's a non-gay word? I don't know, man. Uh. The Marines say a lot of gay stuff. Speaking of gay Marines, we know Brent's listening. He doesn't want to come on, Josh. 
your buddy is uh he's too busy for us you know since the marines have their their camis you guys got pride flags yet we all know the marines are going woke too you guys can't you guys can't lie so everybody say hey to Brent. He takes that shit so seriously. Like any any time I talk about Marines, whether it's live or in our group, I'll hear about it in our group. Well, at least we're not the, the gay army. <laughs> if you guys follow me on Twitter, I shared a picture that he put in our group about uh, <laughs> me and Jared's live. He took a screenshot of me and Jared talking live. This is the shit you deal with. And it was something about like same sex marriage and or same sex and stuff. And he's got like a, a rainbow flag up in the corner, like up here. It was hilarious, man. <laughs> it's like it's like out of nowhere. Not not like, oh, I watched your live chat or anything. It's just like that picture just shows up in the group. So I like log into the group. Oh. Okay, we're gay. Sure. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. But anytime I talk about the Marines, Brent will share a picture of like army guys and UCPs just looking absolutely ridiculous. And I mean, what am I going to say? What, what's my response going to be? It's It's not like army guys run around acting like we're the best, you know. Some guys do, like I like I said when I was talking to Josh, like, yeah, there's a lot of army guys that fucking suck because they, you know, think they're special, but I'm never like that. I give everybody shit, and I think people can back me up. I talk enough shit about the army and my own people to where you can never think I'm an, I'm an elitist. It's just, I don't even talk about the infantry, man. Joe's fucking dumb. All the stupid policies and rules we have in, in in the army. It's because somebody did some dumb shit. And a first sergeant or sergeant major got tired of it. And was like, okay, well, we're going to write a policy on this. No more smoking next to buildings. You got to be 50 feet away. And it's like, why can't we smoke next to a building? Nobody cares. Like, we're not setting concrete building fire. And then you go listen to the Joe Rumor Mill. That's what we call it, the rumor mill. And you find out, oh yeah, private so and so was smoking next to the building. The ash, the ash, the butt can was way too full. Nobody cleaned it up. There was trash in it. Dude threw a cigarette in there, lit the whole fucking thing on fire. The whole wall is blank. The door caught on fire, and it's like, oh, that's why we can't smoke within fifty feet of buildings because people are fucking retarded. Yeah, got it. <laughs> so it's like. I learned I learned as a young leader in the army, like, yep, for every stupid policy you have, it's because somebody did did that one thing and now there's gotta be a rule about it. It's because of the sergeant majors. <laughs> Fucking Karen's. We we fire all sergeant majors. They're useless. They just do Karen policies. They just sit around and write policies to protect guys. Kind of like the COVID rules. Who wrote the COVID rules in the military? Sergeant majors. Officers didn't write that shit. Bored, useless sergeant majors wrote that shit and then sent it up to a major or a colonel to get approved. And the colonel's like, this is a good idea. Everybody in uniform should wear masks. It doesn't make any sense. We all should be fit and healthy to wear a cold doesn't bother us, but we should all wear a mask. Good job, sergeant major. This will be on your NCOER. You'll get an award for it. Roger that, sir. <laughs> <clears throat> Glocks are totally homo, you know. You know what? I've shot Glocks. They're they're great. <clears throat> like I said earlier, though, I'm, I'm totally a hipster. If everybody's talking about one thing, I'm I'm looking for something else just to be different. Sometimes it's stupid. 
I dyed my ACUs and they actually look good now. Yeah, I've seen people dye them with the RIT stuff. I tried that and fucked mine up. Didn't work. Um, they, they, I, I got the green the YouTubers recommended. I, I did what they said and it came out to be like way too dark. Um, but like I've said many times, the problem with the UCPs isn't this. The pattern is good. The pattern is really good for IR and night vision. Uh, during the day, it's good for dirty snow, mountainous regions. But the UCPs saw a massive drop in quality. The, the crotch gets ripped out really quickly, even though there's reinforcement. Uh, the Velcro quits working after a month in the field. The fucking pol the, your pockets, your cargo pockets will eventually fall off. Ours started to fall off, so we just ripped them off. And yeah, there were Sergeant Majors downrange and Ramadi. Like, where's your pocket, soldier? It's like, they fucking fell off, Sergeant Major. Well, you need to go get a new uniform. Roger that. I'll head down to the nearest Walmart and supply store and get my fucking new gay uniform. <laughs> it's not like we're out here doing stuff. Jesus. Um, the UCPs, they went to that stupid zipper up the thing so that zipper will break and i don't know too many grunts who know how to field repair a zipper so i can replace a button within five minutes on my bdus and i think i do have an acu jacket that i did the zipper finally totally ripped off so i just ripped it all off and then i just sewed my own uh buttons on it very easy man you can't field repair a zipper I, I can't, and I don't think I know any grunts that can. Yeah, and then the, the stupid zipper would sit, you know, unless you closed it all the way up like Hollywood collars. You'd close it up to about here, and that's right where the top of your IBA would sit. So we would usually leave it unzipped completely, just haphazardly close it, throw in our IBA, and that was our uniform. So, yeah, I mean, the pattern, like I said, the pattern is great. Um, it works under night vision. It's really good stuff. It's the quality of it is garbage. You know, you can take, you can take BDUs, multicams and stuff. Uh, yeah. And fucking spray paint them, man. Uh, well, the multicams are fine under night vision. All the newer stuff is, but you could take BDUs and even tiger stripes and just spray paint them. <clears throat> it'll improve it and it'll, It'll help it under IR. I should do a video on that one day. I'm surprised Brent hasn't done it. Brent, did you do a, did you do a, well, you guys don't say BDU because you're too cool. You say M81. Have you done a M81 camis spray paint video? I'm going to go find it. If not, I'm going to do it. Even if Brent did it, I'll do my own and just say Brent's gay. This, mine's better. <laughs> Brent's a cool dude. <sighs> Josh, you're all right, too. See, why do I have more friends who are Marines than Army guys? Sto well, Stoker's Army. He was a Marine first, though. So, aren't you guys always Marines? And then... Jared was Navy. Coleman. Coleman was, uh, I don't think he did. Coleman would be the Coast Guard guy of the group. That's what Coleman Outdoors would be. Guys, Coleman Outdoors, he seems like a hippie backpacker. But every time he's been out here, he's been a nut job. Like the first season, I didn't get any of his uh, off-camera shenanigans. But he brought up the most ruthless ideas. He was like, why don't you guys do this? You know, you're doing the seer stuff. Why don't you do this? And I'm just like, I'm like, damn, dude. These guys are already exhausted and just cold and wet and miserable. I'm like, you want to fucking string them up with chains and use the winch on my quad to drag a guy up the side of the building? I'm like, fucking A. And then I'm taking notes. Uh-huh. Yeah. What, what else? What else do you want to do? <laughs> you know, so... Coleman has, he has some ruthless ideas, man. He's like, he's like, you guys are a bunch of babies. He doesn't really cuss, but I could imagine he's like, you guys are a bunch of fucking pussies. So I could imagine, you know, 
uh, the ideas for the next time are going to be, you know, it's going to be out of control. But we, I, we can't hurt the guys, you know. They're coming out here for fun. We already fucked up Tom's wrist. Uh, Clinton hurt his knee even more. I fucked my knee up. Like, we got to – maybe we do need a sergeant major. Maybe Brent needs to come out and be sergeant major and, you know, carrying some shit, write some policies for us. Randall will not run. No handcuffs and not too tight. I don't know. He's the only Sergeant Major type we got out there. Stoker's retired. He's not doing any first sergeant shit. He's actually all about fucking guys up even more like Coleman. Maybe I need to vet my personnel more. Maybe it's good we have Brent. <laughs> So there was some fucked up parts in that one. You guys probably know what I'm talking about if you've seen it. There were some fucked up things that happened. And uh, you can see who was not as brutal as you thought. So there was a couple times where everybody flinched and was like, holy shit. Uh, one of them, even Eric, well, he was joking. But he set the camera down on the table and he was like, Randall, this has been fun. Uh, I hope you guys have a good show. I'm going home. <laughs> and, he, and he just walked out. But that same event, maybe you guys know what I'm talking about. I'll see if I can find the episode. Which one was that? Maybe I can play it without... Was that it? All right. Well, there was a fucked up event um, where even Brent flinched and was not very happy about it. No, it was pretty cool. It's good stuff. So I think the event should challenge everyone and push everyone, including the personnel. I'm happy about that. So it's going to be episode four. Right. Yeah, I think it's episode four. Where the fuck? I like the intros of this season. I'm proud of those. No, I guess it's episode three. Where is it? Well, episode two is their first resistance part. Yeah, because I remember watching it live and... Um, <clears throat> Watching the comments live, I knew people would be like, holy crap. Yep. It's episode three. I'll share it for y'all. Episode three. Very uncomfortable. Uh, we were actually live streaming that. And it's funny because... YouTube did not boot the stream or give me a strike or anything, but shortly after it ended, so I, I wanted to live stream and I had dual cameras. So I had Tom in the pit and I had Clinton getting interrogated and I got, I got them flip flop live. And, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting behind the, this table I set up in the interrogation room and I got the camera there and I can see Tom on the camera outside. And I'm just like, so we're, we're, we're just going through this stuff, you know, and they're also getting their video for the show. And like, we're like live streaming this shit, man. And there's no script. So Brent and Stoker, they're doing their thing. And it was really cool, man, because none of that shit was scripted. We talked about it in the live interview, but like Brent and Stoker, everything they did was just on the fly. They would do a little bit of planning before going in there, before they grabbed the dude and brought him in. But, uh, you know, and they would talk about, well, you know, we can build this story here and stuff. But 
once they got down and got in front of the dude and in the camera, it was just they just fucking played it up, man. It was it was really impressive. I can't improvise that well, hell no. And they did it really well. But so we're doing this live part, and uh I, I wish I would have saved some because this program will record it for you, but it just the quality was way too bad. The internet was shit. But we're like live streaming this shit, you know. And fucking Stoker didn't tell me what he's doing. So they they do this this thing where Stoker just has Clinton do some really messed up shit. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, you know, I don't give a fuck, man. So I'm like, I'm like looking around the room as this is going on. And, and there's like a buildup, you know, Stoker's, I'm not going to ruin it for you guys. You guys need to go watch it. But Stoker's going through it, you know, and at one point Clinton gets a gun in his hand. And so I'm like, oh, it's getting interesting because none of it's scripted. He hasn't talked to me about it. It's just happening. And I'm sitting there like, yeah, and we're live. And it there's like a slow build up. By the time things start to get a little fucked up, it's about a 10 minute period of progression. So you're like, ooh, what's he going to do now? So we're all just kind of like this, you know, and Coleman's got his camera and he's just like, but but still filming you know and everybody's you can tell like go watch the scene i i shared the link up here i'll share it again because it disappeared so fast uh episode three go watch it and you'll notice at the scene oops at the scene that i'm talking about um you'll notice that all the other people on camera start to back away so by the time this scene happens, I I cut a certain part out uh, where I just cut the a certain part of the camera out to not get in trouble. But um, there's nobody else in the background. All the bad guys have backed away because they're all off to the side, just like, holy shit, are we really doing this? You know, and like a couple of them looked back at me and I'm just sitting there like, we're fucking doing it <laughs> and it was live on youtube and uh yeah so that goes down and that scene is pretty much ended stoker does a couple more things with clinton and then they bring him back to either the pit or the box and so i'm sitting back there behind the laptop with the computer running and i'm just like uh Oh, there it is. Can we pin that? All right. There, there's a link for you guys. Episode three. It is the whole thing is awesome, but it, that one is definitely worth it's worth an, an extra watch. But um, <laughs> so, you know, Clinton gets hooded and escorted out and they go put them wherever they put them. And then I'm sitting there. Coleman walks by. And he's just like, well, Randall, this has been fun. You guys have a good time. And he sets the camera on the table. Brent kind of walks by just like mm. <laughs> everybody like walks out and then Stoker's just sitting there and he's just like, fuck yeah. And I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> and so that was like, that was like the main thing we talked about for the next couple of days was like, holy shit. And I'll tell you, you know, Brent Tulsky was a little uncomfortable with that. So good shit. I was happy, man. Everybody got a little bit beat up. I got hurt. Tom got hurt. Clinton got hurt. Some of the some of the staff got upset. Stoker. Stoker hasn't been affected yet. I'm starting to think he's a little evil. That's why he belongs out here. <laughs> That's why he's one of the main planners, because he's an evil fucking dude. Good shit. And I didn't purposely hide it, but, um, you know, we're all, we're all having a good time, man. It's really fucking fun. This time it sucked ass for the contestants, but while the contestants are in their OP, the op fours out there grilling at their camp, having a good old time, drinking beer, playing up the bad guy role. Um, we didn't really drink here at HQ because we were worried about the guys out there at night and, they couldn't really call on the op four to help them, even though they were closer to each other. So we had to kind of monitor them. I think I, I think I probably had a couple beers, but I don't want to get drunk. But the op four is having a good time. Once they all get captured and we're back at the place, 
and the guys are either in the hole or in the box or getting interrogated. It's just not getting drunk and stupid. You know, we're all adults, but just all having a good old fucking time, man. Throwing back some beers. I think we had some Modelo's. <laughs> shitty beer and shitty seer show stuff. It's good times. So, Benjamin... <clears throat> Have you or anyone here in this feed had a chance to fire the SIG XM7? I haven't shot it. The only new rifle I sh or the only new weapon I shot was our new M9 SIG Sauer. We either call it an M7 or an M27. That new rifle, I uh, I think Brent has talked about using it. Uh, at least that's what they're trying to give the Marines. Might want to ask him. No, but any anything the new, anything the Army would take on new, I'm not interested. Any Anything the military wants to take on new, I'm not interested. You know, the last uh, 20 years, they've been experimenting with stuff, and it's all just been ridiculous. <clears throat> I think most, you know, grunt stuff is grunt stuff. You got to be fit and carry shit and go find and fix and kill the enemy. You know, it's pretty simple stuff. The tech just adds a little bit to it, but you still have to be a grunt. The tech is not going to get you to the fight, and it's not going to win the fight. You got to be fit enough to get there and do the fight. And the tech might help you get an edge. But, you know, oftentimes, man, the tech gets in your way. It breaks down, your batteries die, or you don't have batteries. Oftentimes, the tech just fucking pisses us off and we just want to throw it in the woods. But we can't because it costs too much. <clears throat> yeah, but, you know, most of the advancements in our military in the last freaking 20, 30 years, it's been tech stuff, not grunt stuff. You can, dude, you can still give grunts uh, an M14 or even an M1 and they would be fine. You know, it, we, we would, uh, most of us would be happy to have that. My designated marksman in Ramadi loved it. We got the uh, M21. It's basically an M14 with a synthetic stock and then it's got your picatinny rail system so they can add optics and and shit to it but it's basically an m14 um not automatic uh and dude they love that fucking thing man that's why the designated marksman got them you know you got a fucking 30 caliber uh 762 weapon and 10 round magazines with optics like a, a loophole fucking mark three scope on it like those guys were dude they were reaching out and touching shit and they had a blast the uh snipers we each team like i got issued a m24 which is like a remington you know hunting rifle it's pretty cool but we didn't get much use out of it because like i said our ops were more about an ambush on an ied team I don't know if you guys know this, but um, actually sitting in an OP and watching an IED team function, that was the craziest thing because, you know, it, it probably was this way in a lot of parts of the country. But uh, in Ramadi, they were they were putting in these EFPs, explosively foreign projectiles, like basically shape charges. So it's like a little charge with like a copper plate or some kind of copper disc or round whatever copper that would fucking, it was like an RPG basically, but that copper shit would be hot and molten and it would hit our armor and it would, whatever it hit, it turned into shrapnel against us. So it wouldn't be like a really big boom. It's not like a, a big explosion, but it would turn our armor against us basically. But I think because of this and because we were also dealing with a lot of people who were all about fighting us, the IED teams, it wasn't just a, a farmer dude with a shovel going out there 
dig a little bit on the side of the road and put a bomb in place, run a cable and shit. It was entire teams, you know. So like the first the first hindsight I did, um, I remember we were sitting on a rooftop not far from OP uh, Copperhead. But we were like right up the road. We called it Sea Lake Road. So you can look at Ramadi, Iraq. One day I'll show you guys my map that I had while I was out there. I still have my military map while I was there, the sector map. So we're sitting out there, not too far from friendly units, but, you know, far away enough to, to feel isolated, just four of us. And we're laying on the rooftop. The route clearance guys had gone through. We dismounted and did our little thing and got up to the rooftop. And we're, um, we're looking down on this IED site. And basically, you just wait on people to come out. And, you know, oh, they cleared the road. Well, let's put another bomb in. And so... We're expecting, you know, Farmer Bob to come out with a shovel and maybe another dude to help him and put a bomb in the road. And I, I was fucking blown away, man. Uh, a white truck pulled up and a, like a black SUV pulled up. And we're just like, are these fucking contractors? Like, what are these guys doing? A uh, couple guys get out with AKs and like almost in a uniform and start pulling security. They, they get out and like pull security and then they kind of push to the end. Some other guys push to the farther end and then some other guys get out and start doing the bomb. And we're sitting there, we're like looking through our scopes and binoculars watching this. And we're just like, we're like, we, we still thought they were contractors until we started to see them fucking with the road. And we're just like, it, it was like being in a training environment. We're like, dude, we're like, this is a, this is a, a team. This is an actual team. They have security people and they have an actual bomb team getting out there uh, doing this thing. It's like, this is like legit. This is not farmer Brown shit. Fucking come out of here with a shovel, putting a bomb in the road. It's like, holy crap, man. These guys are professionals. And, the it, it was so strange because i remember thinking like <laughs> should have popped some rounds off <laughs> what the fuck you think we did but i, I remember uh th sitting there thinking like dude this is like this this feels like training this feels like a like this can't be real you know so you know, we're sitting there watching and we call up and we're like, hey, uh, this is team such and such at, at grid, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're watching a team of people. Looks like they're putting a bomb in the road. And we were probably we were less than 300 meters away for sure. And um, it, it's, it was just it was unreal because that was the first time I ever legit watched an IED team work. And sh I'm sure in the in other places, you know, and maybe less professional areas not as hot areas i'm sure it could have been like what we thought it was the stereotype you know but it was like a fucking legit team and you know so we call up and mike wants to know if we pop some shots off well we popped more than a few off it's it's an ambush so uh we had been in plenty of firefights but a situation like this where you're not being fired upon it's kind of like a secondary threat because somebody's putting a bomb in the road that you could drive across or friendly forces could drive and hit. So, you know, we got to we got to do the procedure. So we call up, you know, um, grid and all this bullshit, you know, like we have a team that's putting a bomb in the road. They have a security element out, blah, blah, blah. So even our talk is just like, what? You know, so we're like, yeah, like we need to make sure this isn't a, uh, some kind of Delta or security contracting element doing something else, you know, all the possibilities go through your mind because it's so unreal to watch. It's just unreal. Um, and this, Oh, this is broad daylight by the way, you know? So later on in Ramadi, we would, we would see IED teams doing this shit in broad daylight, one block away from a friendly patrol. So we would have a friendly patrol going up one route and a block away, there would be a, an IED team putting shit down on the road. That's how good they were. And that's, that's how ballsy they were. Cause they're like, yeah, they're over there. Fuck them. They get out, pull security, do the bombs and everything. And, and we're watching all this. We're like, 
well, there's our friendly patrol. There's the IED team, you know. Uh, a couple times, F-16s uh, overhead spotted those guys and <laughs> royally fucked them up before we did. And that was, that was just amazing. And you'd see the patrol lose their shit because all of a sudden the road is just erupting a block away, you know. And then we all get the call. Uh, we got fucking pilots in the air. They spotted an IED team. And it's like, well, you could have fucking warned us, guys. Thanks. That's how Ramadi was. Um, sh shit was blowing up everywhere. Lots of friendly fire. Uh, but anyway, so this first incident, um, you know, haven't, I haven't really told war stories. So this, this is the first one. You guys get your first war story. But, uh, you know, so we get the call back from the talk. They're like, we don't have friendlies. We're not tracking anybody there. That That's an IED team. Like, you're, you know, you're clear to engage. Uh, use deadly force. And we're just like... <laughs> I'm, I'm the only NCO there. I got fucking privates and specialists with me, guys that I, you know, trained to do this stuff with me. And I'm, I'm just, we're, we're just laying there. I'm just like, uh, all right, guys, we, we can fucking shoot. So we'll do our countdown mad minute. Uh, we, we, in the early days, we did bring out our 24s cause we thought it was going to be a, a sniper mission. We quit doing that after a while. Uh, but I had, I had a dude on the 24, I was on the spotting scope, and then we had an M4 with a grenade launcher, and I think we had another M4. So I was like, all right, you know, we, we had an SOP, but I'm like, okay, so we'll do a countdown, mad minute. Everybody has their targets. Everybody had their sectors of fire. People had personnel picked out. So, uh, yeah, you know, we, we counted down, and – Boom, mad minute, typical ambush style, and we're within we're we're less than 300 yards out. So yeah, whole team was wiped out, vehicles decimated. So uh we learned um we got a lot of intel out of that, but we learned from then on that it wasn't going to be you know the standard we were already told it wasn't gonna be a, a sniper spotter type mission you know um but then we learned hey we're in small teams and we're doing ambushes against teams of people like multiple personnel so we're like we, you know i remember coming back to my platoon sergeant he was the one that was the sniper in our platoon he was the badass and he sent me to sniper school to learn all this shit and teach our guys this shit and he's like he's like i told him what happened you know while i'm talking to s2 giving them the brief and the platoon sergeant's like, he's like, dude, you need to be prepared for those guys shooting back at you. I'm like, yep, yeah, okay, cool. So we started going out. We eventually we dropped the the sniper rifle because, dude, it holds five rounds in the, in the clip. It's an actual clip, but it holds five rounds in that. And you're like, like fucking, you know, shoot, charge it, shoot, charge it, and then you got to reload. So we realized like we needed some fucking firepower because what if these guys wanted to counter ambush us? And later on, they did later on. They called on to what we were doing. The IED team would try to do their things. We would fucking start firing at them. And then from another direction, we would just get a hail of gunfire on us. So they had been observing and, and picked up on what we were doing and decided to start fucking around that way. So, you know, anyway, it progressed. But toward the end, we started bringing out, I would have at least one saw with us because it is a machine gun, but it's light enough for a dude to carry all over the place. You know, a 240 is awesome. It just requires too much. And we did have to be stealthy a little bit. Like we broke into some houses, some families invited us in, we stayed in some wood lines, but you do have to be kind of stealthy in a 240. It's fuck you, you can't carry that bitch and all the ammo and everything with it. Like, yeah, it's it's a little too much. So we would have at least one saw on the team. Um, I started I I would use my M4 and I was as a team leader, I had the gr grenade launcher. So my primary weapon turned into fucking um H E, not so I had two types of HE. We had a high explosive and I would use high explosive because it was usually an open environment and that's more like a grenade. And then I also had the HEDPs, high explosive dual purpose. That's where you could, you know, 
fucking take doors off the hinges, put holes in light walls, shoot them into windows for fun. Uh, I would, I would shoot their, I would shoot people's vehicles with ATDPs that seem to do a, a little bit more of disabling, especially around the engine block. Man, you guys are getting all kinds of war stories. <laughs> I, I never fucking talk about this shit. I don't know how we got into this. Um. Oh well, it was because it's weapons. It's fun stuff. Ambushes. It's good stuff. I do have some videos where I'm gonna talk about ambushes. Um. Yeah. So, okay, we'd have a saw, uh, an M40 with my 203, and then I would usually have another dude with a rifle and a 203, and then we might take out another saw with us because we realized we wanted the firepower, and then especially as soon as they started counter ambushing us, you know, we were like. We're like, dude, we need fucking firepower. And so in addition to my rifleman shit and my grenade, my grenadier shit. Um, oh, we all started bringing more grenades too. like we we didn't really use grenades too much. You know, the possibility of blowing up your own dudes in Ramadi was just too high. But um we would get into our positions, you know, and I would usually take a couple grenades. You know, I don't know if you guys know about, probably not, but Hollywood is ruined grenades. They're, they're not big fireballs, but they're still an effective weapon. So, but we have all these safeties on them and the army at least wants you to have uh, the spoon. The spoon is the, the little metal thing that comes down on the grenade that you hold um, and once that flips off, it's activated. So the army would want tape around the spoon and the grenade. So, and then they wanted us to tape the safety device. There's a safety clip up top. So if I remember correctly, there's three safeties, two. So you got, you've got a clip up top. You flip that clip off. Then you pull the actual safety pin out, and then as you're holding it, that spoon. So there's three safeties. That spoon is your third safety. So, you know, the Army, not trusting Joes and their equipment, <clears throat> they wanted us to have the spoon taped around the grenade in case the other safeties failed, and then they wanted to have us uh, have it taped around the upper clip. So basically, when you were getting into contact, or you were going out on a mission, your first job was to take all this tape off. And believe it or not, guys, you know, under the stress of fire and everything, there's plenty of times where guys would forget to take the tape off their spoon, you know, and they got the tape up off top. So they, they, in the clip, I couldn't even pretend to show you, but if you're holding a grenade like this, the clip is like you just sweep that way and that clip flies off. Then you put your finger in the ring and pull. So there's plenty of guys that it's it's like a training thing. It's just like, okay, you know, swipe, pull, throw. And they would do that, but they did they, but they still had the tape around the spoon. So they're basically throwing a live grenade, but the spoon is still taped. <laughs> so it does nothing. It's just like throwing a baseball at the guys. Um, luckily we never had any thrown back at us, but so when we would, so when we would go out to the hide sites, um, especially if I thought it would be possible guys might try to sneak up on us because they did do that to some other OPs didn't happen to us. Um, so especially if we were on a rooftop, you know, we were worried about guys attacking us and getting so close that we could no longer escape. So I would actually take my guys and we would take all our grenades out and we would prep them. And so prepping a grenade is we would take all the tape off. We would remove that safety clip. And so all you have to do is pull the pen and throw it. Okay. So it, that we call that prep. So it's ready to go. That's traditionally how a grunt carries his grenades, but with all the safety bullshit, you know, you had to have to tape and all that. So basically if you were going on a raid, and you were expecting contact, or when we would sit in our hide sites, we would take all that tape and shit off and, you know, save it for later, and we would have it prepped. So all you got to do is grab it, pull the pin, and throw it. 
right? And then if we were going to bug out or, or we were just done with the OP and we were going to leave, we would save everything. You know, you can put those clips back on if you can't find it or you can't get it back on. You can just tape around the safety. You know, it's it's a safety pin and it's a ring and you can fold that ring against the grenade and then you can tape that. And then you tape the spoon, you're good to go. It, it's dummy proof pretty much. So we would set those up and have those prepped. And a couple times we didn't have people, you know, kind of try to assault at us. But it's like, come on, dude, we got a saw. I got at least two grenade launchers. We got all these grenades. Like the the few times people actually did try to assault our position, they fucked around and they found out and they ran away because it they it, it was not good for them. I also carried, um, well, I carried all these parachute flares and star clusters, signaling devices for my 203. I carried a couple smoke grenades for the 203, and those are really fun. You can shoot, I swear, man, the max effective range of a 203 is 400 meters, uh, 200 meters point target. I could shoot those fucking smoke grenades, I swear, 500 meters. I swear I could launch a smoke grenade and... 300 meters away you'd see it pop and you'd see the freaking smoke trail and then it would just keep going and it just disappear but that's what i used to shoot at cars for warning shots because i mean in ramadi there wasn't really warning shots you you could already shoot at stuff even though we had already been through the baghdad days in the early days where the rules of engagement got pretty strict but um I also carried, uh, I didn't fuck with the regular smoke grenades. I like the high concentrate smoke grenades. They are heavy as shit. Probably like five pounds a piece. They are very heavy, but it'll smoke out a whole freaking field, a whole building and multiple buildings. And it lasts for it minutes. Like your average smoke grenades kind of like eh, it dissipates and it's like, all right, well, if it's a bright color, people see it, but you're not really concealing movement. The high concentrate, holy fuck, dude. When we would leave our OPs, I would throw that behind us, and it didn't matter where the wind was. It would just, for like five minutes, this fucking thing would just billow and just smoke out the whole area. You couldn't see a damn thing. That was really cool. It was, it was very heavy, though. Very heavy to carry. Uh, 400 meters is 400 yards. They're almost the same. A meter is a hundred centimeters. It's the metric system is very easy to convert for Joe's. So 10 millimeters is a centimeter. A hundred centimeters is a meter. A thousand meters is a kilometer. Uh, you know, a thousand kilograms is a ton. One ton is 2,200 pounds, something like that. So the metric system, it's, uh, you know, all my German buddies say we're idiots because we don't understand it. But actually, if you, if you look at the metric system, it's kind of more dummy proof. Um, and anybody who's worked in carpentry or welding or trades or anything, uh, and they, when they try to fuck with, quarter eighth sixteenths five eighths inches seven eighths inches show that your your metric system buddies show them an american tape measure with five eighths sixteenths inch seven eighths and all that shit they'll lose their fucking minds they don't understand it also a 30 seconds of an inch is smaller which means more accurate than a millimeter the smallest the metric system has is a millimeter the smallest we have is a 30 seconds of an inch, which is just a tad bit shorter than the millimeter. So, no, we didn't go to the moon on the metric system and Von Braun. We went to the moon on the imperial system using 30 seconds of an inch because you can machine that tight, which is tighter than a millimeter, the metric system. So, um, what a yard. So, I can't remember which one is longer. I think a yard is slightly longer than a meter. You guys will have to look that up. Yeah, because, yeah. So, a hundred yards might be like a hundred meters plus 
I don't know, a hundred and like 0.5 meters or some shit. It's not, it's not a big deal, you know, but, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, well, let's see. There's these easy conversion charts. Oh, a yard is three feet, by the way, if it helps you understand that. <clears throat> okay, the, the, the meter is longer, all right? One yard is 0.9144 meters. So a meter is longer. I had it backwards. Okay, so 100 meters is going to be a little more in yards. And it's not too big, not too big of a deal. So let's, uh, let's flip flop this. So let's say 400 meters is 437 yards. 300 meters is our standard shooting range, 328 yards. Wow. You know, that's actually a pretty big difference. So when the Marines, the Marines use yards, they'll say, well, we shoot at 300 yards. Okay. Well. 300 yards is only 274 meters. So the, the army shoots farther. <laughs> oh, wait, don't the Marines qualify at 500? All right, that's 457 meters. Yeah, so it's it's not a it's not a really big deal. Did we do 100 yet? So 100 meters, everybody can understand that. 100 meters is 109 yards. So 100 meters is not a football field, like I've always told people. A football field, which is 100 yards, is 91 meters. Neither one of them makes sense converting back and forth. But that's the easiest way I found to explain it to my American buddies. You know, you can say... A hundred meters is pretty close to a hundred yards, and then you're only off by nine meters. Uh, big whoop. I like in uh, in Jarhead when he's like, "We got to use distances that make sense," and I don't, I don't mean your dicks. I don't need to hear three thousand four hundred forty-seven inches. <laughs> And is uh is Josh still around? Do you still have um we still got a Marine in here? I'd be curious since the Marines like to say yards for shooting, what do they use for land nav? They can't be they can't be converting military grid reference system to fucking yards. Cause that would be inaccurate as hell. So that would make oh shit. That would make a grid square instead of a grid square being a thousand square meters. That would make a grid square one thousand nine hundred or one thousand and ninety three yards squared. Yeah, imagine calling that shit up for a grid reference. Your protractors wouldn't work. Yeah, I mean the metric system is it's easy, so I, I can understand why we use it. It's very easy. It's easy to convert. It's easy to go up and down. It's easy to reduce. <clears throat> Tell a German. Uh, I had a. Uh, I had some of my German buddies. One of them was an engineer helping me renovate my house, and we were leveling it and doing some pretty fun stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I need a two by four. Fucking, uh, you know, this length. He'd hand it to me, and it's woodwork. So I'm like. You know, cut off a cunt hair. What the hell is a cunt hair? Cut off a sixteenth of an inch. What is a sixteenth of an inch? I'm like, look on the tape measure, dude. So then while he's bored, he puts the tape measure on the two by four. Well, it was four by fours we were working with. So he puts the two the tape measure on the four by four. He's like, uh, this isn't four by four. This is three and a half by three and a half. And I'm like, I know, dude. Give me the fucking thing. I know it's not four by four. He's like well, you said four by four. This is the wrong equipment. Typical Germans. This is incorrect. 
And I'm like, I know, dude, we just call it a four by four. He's like, what is a two by four? A two by four is an inch and a half by three and a half. But that's not two by four. <laughs> you know, Germans, hey, you want, that's how we beat the Germans in the war. We weren't better than them. We didn't have more equipment. We didn't have more bodies and more supplies. They're just too exact. That's their problem. <laughs> we will win the war in eight months. We do not need cold weather equipment. And Russian winner said, no, the fuck you don't. Perfect planners. How the fuck you going to Russia without winter gear? Ego and stupidity. Well, guys, we are almost to four hours, and I'm tired of talking to myself. That's what it feels like. If there's any burning questions, I'll get to them. Why is Brent0331 so gay? I don't know, man. You got to ask him. I can't speak for the Marines. I, I like Marines. Just, I don't understand the uh, the pride flag sometimes. <laughs> Marines and their ESG scores. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, Fist Medicine, um, I invited people to come in like two hours ago. So maybe next time. <clears throat> I don't want to bring somebody on now. We're about to get out of here. I appreciate it, though. Come in next time. Yep, I, I shared the link in the very beginning for anybody to join. All my friends are gay, and most of you guys didn't want to, but that was a cool chat, man. You know, almost four hours just bullshitting with you guys. Haven't done this in over a year, so. uh, You know, I would say we'd make this um, a regular event, but that ain't going to happen. I was actually just celebrating that little silver award back there youtube youtube gave this guy a present i got some candy yeah but um you know all the seer challenge questions that's very cool guys i'm glad to see you guys are getting into that i was wondering if any of the grunts gave a shit so for anybody who missed that i think i already have it let's let's try this this is either gay porn or it's the seer challenge or it's the same thing there's a link to, oh, that's the website. Whoops. All right. Well, whatever. You'll find it there too. Go check out the Seer Challenge if you don't know what we're talking about. Really fun event. Good times, good dudes, and we're just going to keep growing it. So I appreciate y'all, and I'll see you in the next one whenever we do it. Lots of videos to come.